I think we should probably get started. So welcome everyone. Oh, thank you, Phil. Gosh, uh, suddenly I'm so much louder than I'm used to being. Uh, welcome everyone to the what is the 29th consecutive Astro RU Symposium. Um, and what I'm pleased to announce is our first consecutive in-person uh, Astro RU Symposium. Uh, I have just a couple announce mundane announcements to get out of the way before we begin in earnest um, about the schedule. So we're going to uh, do the usual thing. We're going to have a couple topical sessions with some breaks, short break in the morning, a large break for lunch. Um, and that's designed so that we can all go enjoy the Latino Initiative Program posters um, over in the Perkin Courtyard, I think. Is that the plan? Or are they in the library? They're outside. They're outside? OK. Thank you. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between um, our science and the Latino Initiative science. Um, so I would encourage you to all go enjoy that uh, and the free food as well. Um, and there'll be another coffee break in the afternoon before we end. Um, so, uh, but I would also just like to express my personal gratitude to the students for all their hard work and um, to mention that it has been uh, quite a journey to get to this point where we could have an in-person uh, event and an in-person summer like this. And I'm just so grateful for all the support that we received from so many people uh, to make this happen. And I'd like to mention three in particular. Uh, I'm not sure the students are aware, but um, the landscape was really shifting a lot as we were getting this thing organized. Uh, there was a... <laughs> There was a surge in COVID um, around the April, March timeframe that was pretty scary. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we're a strange beast. We have Harvard rules to follow, and we have SAO rules to follow that come down from on high, from Smithsonian and Washington. And we have to do, you know, so we have two sets that we have to follow. And it's, you know, office space and social distancing and masking and everything. And this can be a challenge. Um, and I have a new appreciation for that and for my limitations as a scientist as well, because um, this thing could not have happened without the support of a lot of people um, who, in the, in the response to COVID, when we scientists are all talking to each other in these little rectangles uh, that we normally don't talk to, um, like uh, especially Kara Tatunjan, she had to work so hard to manage all the uh, administrative details that were changing, the ground was shifting all the time. And so she had to put in like twice as many hours as she normally does to make this thing happen, on top of all the other things she was managing. Um, and then as that was coming together, Harvard said, you know, we're actually not going to house the interns at Harvard this year. Sorry, good luck. Um, and so we ended up housing them at Tufts and 
managing the Tufts contract. Uh, by the way, scientists are not qualified to manage housing contracts. I'm just letting you know. I can tell you from personal experience. And so <laughs> that was, I, so I thought, uh, ass me, I thought I was. Turns out not. Um, and uh, you'll be grateful that I did not turn all, over all your private information to Tufts University On Demand. Um, <laughs> and I, I am too. So thank you to Joe Lendl in the Contracts and Grants Department for saving our bacon there. Because in his expertise uh, was essential in getting that to happen. And I was really amazed at how, prof how all his proficiency made that happen in the nick of time uh, so that the students could have housing, not just in our program, but the, the other allied programs that we have. And then um, also, it was so reassuring to me personally to have the backing of our acting director, Mike McCarthy, who right as things were surging, said, you know, you guys go ahead and we're going to support you. Um, you can be in A101, you can have desks, <laughs> you can have computers. And, uh, you know, that's pretty useful. Uh, so we were able to go ahead with the planning uh, and having the support of the director's office was essential. So I'm just very grateful uh, for all that. Um, and that meant a lot to me. So <clears throat> we, have, we have quite a program for you all today. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, we have a lot of excellent students who are going to present the results of a lot of very hard work. Um, and the last thing I would like to say before we get into it is I'd like to encourage you students to enjoy your accomplishments today because you've done a lot. Okay, so uh, why, don't, why don't we begin? Uh, Alex, why don't you come up here and let's get you mic'd up and let's hope that my computer is equal to this task, uh, which I'm having second, uh, I'm having some worries about now. <laughs> Okay, so you do that while I try to set you up. So first we're going to hear from Alex Del Franco of Amherst College, who's going to tell us about a laboratory experiment he's done over the summer uh, to analyze organic molecules in a new and interesting way. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Alex. Um, I'm a rising junior at Amherst College. In the summer, I worked with my advisor, uh, Rafa Martin Dominic. Um, to look at the formation of organic molecules in CO-rich H2-bearing ices. So it's a bit of a background um, to get into things. Uh, the interstellar medium is the space uh, between stars, and it's really comprised of about 99% hydrogen gas and about a 1% heavier silicate dusts. Um, this, the interstellar medium, the diffuse interstellar medium, is really permeated by this damaging high-energy ultraviolet radiation, damaging to any type of chemistry that really wants to form um, any type of complex chemistry. Uh, these bonds will get broken by this high energy radiation. Um, the part of the interstellar medium that we're interested in are these over dense regions called molecular clouds. Um, we're interested in these because they're the sites of future planet and star formation, um, and they have some really interesting chemistry. So, in this figure on the right, you can see um, kind of in the background a lot of stars, and in the center, this kind of very dark uh, area. This is a molecular cloud. Um, the dense dust on the outside of the molecular cloud um, blocks a lot of this ultraviolet radiation. And so the insides of the molecular clouds um, get shielded and get very, very cold. So they can get down to about temperatures of about 7 Kelvin. Um, molecules, when they get this cold, atoms and molecules both, uh, get very sticky. And so um, you get these ices that form, and they form in layers. So down here you have a silicate dust, um, and on this, this dust a layer of water ice will form. And then on top of that, a layer of CO ice will form. And both layers, but especially the CO layer, are prime spots for organic molecule uh, formation. Now, this is really interesting because this tells us what kind of molecules might be present in forming planets um, well before they actually form. Um, 
So we can look a little bit at some, uh, some spectra of ices that have been actually observed. So this is real data. Um, and we have uh, a spectrum. So on the x-axis, we have wavelength. And on the y-axis, we have emission. And the takeaway here is that there are actually a lot of chemist there's a lot of chemistry that we can really see in space. Um, so we have multiple different colors here. And these are emission lines, emission features, of molecules containing carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Um, so um, we have this, this hydrogen presence. So for a long time, hydrogen was thought not to actually interact in these ices um, because it's very volatile. So hydrogen is very light and um, not very sticky, even at these low temperatures. And so um, we thought for a long time that it really wouldn't interact. It would only interact in the gas phase, not in the ice phase. Um, however, it's possible that the CO ices can actually, as they're growing, entrap hydrogen um, within them. And you can get these hydrogen molecules that are uh, stuck in this CO ice. Now, even if this only happens a very little bit, 1%, half percent of this hydrogen actually being entrapped because of the extreme abundance of hydrogen in the ISM, this is actually still a lot of hydrogen um, that can be present in these ices. So there is reason to think that if hydrogen is present, um, it could change the chemistry quite a bit. Um, so we did some laboratory work, um, and it, it might be nice to take a review of some past laboratory work. So over the last 30 years or so, um, a lot of papers have explored this water layer, kind of that first base layer on the silicate dust. There have been fewer papers really exploring the CO layer on top of that. Um, there have been very few papers that have explored the energetic chemistry in this CO layer. So even though the, the dense, kind of the edges of the dense clouds um, protect these ices from this UV radiation, cosmic rays can actually penetrate um, and deliver a little bit of energy um, secondarily to these ices, um, not enough to destroy chemistry, but just enough to actually break the right bonds and create some interest in chemistry. So very few experiments have actually replicated this kind of um, energetic chemistry in the CO layer. And really, only two um, experiments have been conducted with the presence of hydrogen in the CO layer, looking at energetic chemistry. Um, one just looked at CO and hydrogen ices. Um, one included nitrogen as well, um, and what was only done at 4 Kelvin. So our work was to use three gases, so CO, nitrogen, and hydrogen, and explore a temperature dependence of this. So 4 Kelvin is a little bit um, colder than what we actually see in the ISM, even at the center of these cold clouds. Um, so we want to see can we look at realistic temperatures, maybe a little bit warmer, um, with these three uh, components in the ices. So we created these mixtures. We irradiated them um, with very high energy electrons that should replicate uh, about the, the sorts of uh, energy that's delivered by these cosmic rays. Um, and this was kind of the first experiment of its kind. So whatever we did find, we were expecting to, to learn something new, which is very cool. So we did this on an experimental setup called Space Tiger. Um, this is an image of it. It looks a little bit intimidating. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so it might be helpful to break it down a little bit um, in pieces. So we start with a vacuum chamber um, and a cooled copper substrate. So this copper substrate can get down to about 4 Kelvin. Um, this is really replicate the conditions that we would find in this, these dense regions of the ISM. Um, we can inject gas, um, so some type of mixture of the gas, onto the substrate where it will freeze. Um, creating our CO ice layer that we want to learn about. We then irradiate it with electrons to kind of excite this chemistry. Um, and then there are two methods we can use to actually figure out what kind of chemistry happened um, and what molecules we have in the ice now. The first is an infrared laser. So we can bounce the laser off of the, su the copper substrate, um, and we get a spectrum that kind of looks like this. So on the x-axis, we have wave number. Um, for, the, for those who are not familiar with wave number, which I assume are a lot of people, um, we're about in the 2 micron range of the infrared. So you can see a secondary x-axis plot on the top. Um, we have absorbance on the, on the y-axis, so how much of this infrared energy is actually absorbed by this ice. Um, so you get a feature that kind of looks like this, so a Gaussian feature. Um, the height of this feature, or really the area, um, corresponds to about the thickness of the ice as well as the presence of whatever molecule um, we're detecting. The second way we can get stuff out um, is looking at a mass, using a mass spectrometer. Um, so we, can, we have this ice that's frozen on the, the substrate. We can heat the substrate. Um, the ice will melt. It will dissorb. Um, we can vacuum this out through the mass spectrometer um, as it warms, and we can get a curve that looks like this. So um, kind of over time, we're increasing the temperature. There are going to be a lot of temperature axes in the future. So this is kind of worth, worth realizing that it's, this is over time. So as we warm the ice up, we see the presence. This is uh, CO2. Um, we see the presence of a molecule kind of jump up, and then um, go down as we pump as we pump the molecule out um, through the uh, the, the um, mass spectrometer. Um, so we have mass abundance on the y-axis. So kind of this tells us how much 
of this molecule there actually is. If we integrate the curve, we can figure out the total amount um, of the, the atom or molecule that we're looking at. So this is kind of the two data, data pieces that we're going to look at that are going to tell us about these, these ices. So to jump into our results, because we have um, some kind of interesting results, um, we uh, started by running experiments at 4 Kelvin, so kind of replicating experiments that have already been in the literature, and we were able to entrap uh, hydrogen at this temperature. So we see um, this is another infrared spectrum. Um, we have wave number on the x-axis and absorption on the y. And we can see on the left a feature of CO. So CO is one of the original mixtures, so we expect to see that in the ice. Um, and that gives us a sense of about how thick the ice is. Um, and then we see H2, so we see a hydrogen feature, meaning that there is hydrogen in the ice. Um, and this was a three-component mixture, so there also is nitrogen present. We can look a little bit more about um, after we do the irradiation. Uh, we can look at a different spectrum, so we can see how the, a larger portion of the infrared spectrum changes um, between before and after radiation. So we create new molecules, and we want to see how do these features change. So this is a difference spectrum, which means we took the spectrum after radiation and subtracted off the spectrum before. That means that any peaks here should correspond to things that we've actually created um, within this energetic chemistry. So on the left, you can see CO2, um, and then we have C2O, and then we have two H-bearing molecules, which means we actually do have hydrogen present um, in the ice and in the actual chemistry. So the hydrogen, at least at 4 Kelvin, is affecting the types of uh, reactants um, and products that we have. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. We want a little bit more quantitative results of what is present in the ice. So to do that, we can use our mass spectrometry data. Um, so on the x-axis, we have temperature, and this is temperature as we're kind of warming the ices up. Um, so different molecules desorb. They leave the ice at different temperatures. Um, so these temperature ranges are a little bit different for these uh, six products. Um, each of these uh, kind of subplots has a different molecule that we're looking for. So the top three are, are carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen-based. So we see some carbon-oxygen products. Uh, but no carbon-nitrogen uh, products at all. On the bottom, however, we do see quite a bit of hydrogen chemistry. Um, the left two uh, have uh, H2 in them, so two hydrogen molecules, hydrogen atoms. Um, on the right, we have CH4, we have methane, which means there not only is some hydrogen in this ice, but there's actually quite a bit, enough that we can form um, products that include four hydrogen uh, atoms. So now we really wanted to get into the, the results, the, the meat of what we're looking at. Um, that are totally new. Um, so this is looking at, this is another um, infrared spectrum, kind of the same plot that showed hydrogen in the ice before, but now we're looking at it at 4, 6, 8, and 10 Kelvin. Um, so the CO feature is about the same because the ices are about the same thickness. Um, we expect CO as one of the, um, the input uh, gases. But we can see the hydrogen feature now um, is still present at 6 Kelvin and barely, barely present. It could be present at 8 Kelvin, but looks like it definitely is not present at 10. So we have some interesting uh, presence of hydrogen um, at different temperatures. Um, when, after irradiation, we can look at more different spectra. And so this is just a different spectrum at 4 Kelvin and 10 Kelvin. So we're looking at um, any peaks here, again, correspond to things we've created in these ices um, after irradiation. So we have kind of some of the same uh, carbon-oxygen products. We have the original hydrogen-bearing products at 4 Kelvin. But at 10 Kelvin, not only do we not see the hydrogen products at all, um, we see new products that didn't form um, in the hydrogen-bearing ice. So this is starting to get a sense, starting to tell us that there might be some very different chemistry at these two temperatures. Um, but again, if we want to get a little bit um, better view of what's actually happening in these ices, um, we can look at some of the mass spectrometry data. So here um, we have a bunch of axes. So on the x-axis, we have temperature. Um, so this is, again, as we're warming up the ices. We're kind of desorbing, we're melting the ices uh, to figure out what's, what's coming off. And on the y-axis, we have mass abundances. Um, in each column, we have four different experiments that were run at different temperatures. So we have a 4 Kelvin ice, a 6 Kelvin ice, 8, and 10, um, all with the same mixtures originally. Um, so anything different here is temperature dependent. Um, uh, we can see three different uh, molecules in the three rows. And so these are all hydrogen bearing. And so we have uh, two H2 products, and then methane, again, with four hydrogen atoms. And we can see very clear trends. Um, so this is really interesting. This is telling us that, kind of as, as the, some of the last plots might have suggested, uh, as you increase the temperature of the ices, as you increase the temperature at which you grow the ices, um, you get less hydrogen in the ices and um, less hydrogen-bearing chemistry. And really, if you just compare the 4 Kelvin, which definitely have a lot of hydrogen, and the 10 Kelvin, you see very different results. It's also worth noting that um, we see a steeper drop-off uh, in the 
the molecules that require more hydrogen. So there, while there is hydrogen at 8 Kelvin, there's probably less hydrogen uh, than in some of the, the colder ices. We can also look at some other plots, um, some other molecules. Um, so this is a very similar plot, uh, a similar setup. Um, we have the same, the same x-axis and the same columns across the x-axis. Uh, but we have now carbon, oxygen, and then some C C2N2, a carbon-nitrogen um, molecule. And we see kind of an opposite trend. So as uh, hydrogen disappears from these ices, a lot of the carbon and oxygen free themselves up to bond with each other and with the nitrogen as well. And so this kind of makes sense. We see more uh, CO products um, in these, these uh, warmer ices. Especially, we can see C2N2, which isn't present in any of the ices, only at 10 Kelvin. Um, this suggests that for uh, carbon and nitrogen to bond in this way, you really need no hydrogen in the ices whatsoever. Um, if, if there's any hydrogen, even little bits, it could interfere with the creation of these molecules. And so you really do see this radical change in chemistry um, from the hydrogen to non-hydrogen bearing ices. And this is really cool. So this is the first time that um, a lot of these like, we didn't really know what we were expecting. This is the first time a lot of these results uh, have been shown. And so, kind of in summary, we, we present the first ever energetic processing of uh, entrapped hydrogen in a three-component mixture um, across a range of these temperatures. Um, we can show an incredibly strong dependence on uh, temperature for the entrapment of hydrogen um, and the, the products that we see after irradiation. Um, and we can also show that the hydrogen does really affect the chemistry. So not only is there a temperature dependence of hydrogen, but the chemistry does change with the presence of hydrogen, meaning there is a temperature dependence of this chemistry um, that's happening. So different regions of these dense molecular clouds at different temperatures could have very different chemistry um, in the ice grains. Um, our next steps, um, we want to explore how the, the ratios of these uh, three components actually affect this chemistry. Um, there's a huge parameter space that we can explore. Um, outside of temperature, and um, what if we, we swap out nitrogen with other things, we change the masses, there's, there are a lot of uh, very interesting things we can explore, but that's, that's what we've done. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Right. Any questions for Alex? expect them to form in layers like this and not all mixed together? And what do you think, what causes them to form in HDOC into layers instead of just all mixed together? That's a fascinating question. Um, so I know, I'm not totally sure is the answer, um, because I don't have a huge background in, in chemistry. But I know this is a, a very, this has been um, shown in literature for a long time. So this is kind of a widely accepted fact. Um, but I'm not totally sure. That's a fantastic question. It's actually somewhat related to this slide as well. So you say that the clouds are approximately seven. So was the temperature range the like what you expect the range of temperatures to be in the clouds? That's also a great question. So um, no. So the four oh. Kelvin is actually it is unphysical. Okay. Um, but it we're kind of going to explore that for two reasons. I think the first was just to show that we can get hydrogen in the ice. So getting a little bit colder allows us kind of a wider space to explore, so we can have a better. Um, understanding of the trends overall as you go from like four to ten Kelvin, um, it's also um, it's also just kind of um, good to prove that we have a good baseline for what hydrogen entrapment looks like, um, because it's not clear to us that hydrogen entrapment has to happen in this way. So it's possible that hydrogen gets entrapped in other ways. Um, so you can have the ices present, um, like the ices that we would form at four Kelvin would have formed some other way, but still would be present in the ice. So yes, it is unphysical, but we have reason to believe those ices could exist in a different formation mechanism. Yeah. Um, so I had a question. I think you had mentioned that you might return here in, in the fall to continue this work. I was wondering if you cared to describe or if the plans had developed to a point where it was clear to you what direction you might take this this fall. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things we're really interested in is um, is the entrapment of hydrogen under different circumstances um, with different parameters. So um, we have seen, so some papers have shown that if you grow ices up to about 20 Kelvin, 
you can actually, so a much wider uh, temperature dependence. Um, with just CO and hydrogen, you can actually entrap hydrogen um, at much, a much wider range of temperatures, and that would be really interesting because we can see, we see a much wider range of temperatures in the ISM. Um, but so far, when we've run experiments like that, we have not uh, successfully trapped hydrogen, um, especially with the three-component mixtures. Um, so the question then becomes, do we have to change the, the components or the ratios of the components to actually successfully trap hydrogen at these larger temperatures? Um, so a lot of this is, is kind of educated um, guesswork, is you know, trying different things and seeing, can we find chemistry, can we find entrapped hydrogen um, with, with a different, kind of this wide parameter space. Right. Well, let's thank Alex for a great talk. Alright, so next we're going to hear from Ariana Duomo of Duke University, who's going to tell us about her analysis of a unique white dwarf stellar system. My name is Ariana Duomo. I'm a junior at Duke University studying physics. And for the past 10 weeks, I've been working here at the CFA trying to characterize, wait, let me take my mask off. <laughs> trying to characterize a unique white dwarf um, under Dr. Evan Bauer. All right, so I kind of want to break that down a little bit. What do I mean by a white dwarf? And what do I mean when I say it's polluted? So when stars like our sun reach the last stages of their evolutionary life, their outer and shed their outer layers, a white dwarf forms. And so this object will have the mass of the sun contained within the size of the earth. And so to put this into perspective, a teaspoon of white dwarf material would weigh several tons here on earth. And so if an asteroid were to get close to this white dwarf, it would be shredded apart due to its strong gravitational field. And that kind of ties into what I mean when I say that it's polluted. So the shredded bits would collide against each other and form a debris disk, which would then rain down onto the surface of the white dwarf Metals would sink towards the core, while lighter elements like hydrogen and helium would remain at the surface. And so the reason, I included a little star there, um, the reason why heavier elements sink in a white dwarf, but not in a main sequence star um, like the sun, is due to the difference in diffusion time scales for the elements, and also because the white dwarf um, is so dense. And so the white dwarf that I was looking at is very hot and a little bit less than one solar mass, and it has a debris disk. And we know that it has this debris, this debris disk um, because the dust within the disk emits an infrared excess. What makes this white dwarf stand out is that within this circumstellar disk, it has a solid iron, solid iron core planetesimal that's located within the tidal radius. So I mentioned before, if this object was something like an asteroid, it would have been ripped apart um, to form that disk. But because the internal strength of this planetesimal is strong enough, it hasn't shredded apart within this uh, debris disk. And we know that this planetesimal exists because of a paper that was published about two years ago that found a stable periodic variation in the strength and shape of the emission line profiles um, that originate from the debris disk. And so I also want to give a little bit more information as to why this white dwarf and white dwarfs in general are so unique. The debris disk that surrounds the white dwarf furnished surprising clues about the objects that were made up of the shredded material. Comprehensive models allow us to gain insight into the chemical composition and structure of that object. Then we have the ability to add in any missing ingredients to our recipe of what we think goes on under the surface of a white dwarf, which was kind of what my work was. And so in our case, we have the privilege of observing a unique situation, but also a situation that is representative of the life cycle of a very common star. So. In order to extract physics from this system, we need to be able to model the surface of the white dwarf. Our information is gathered from observables that are found in previous work, which I'll go into a little bit of detail later. Once we model the surface, we can then translate that information into what's happening below. So sinking and accretion and things like that. If we can model the physics of these processes, then we can understand a lot about how these systems work. So 
In order to build a foundational model that takes a star through its initial evolution to a white dwarf stage, I mentioned that we referenced previous work. So we want our, our model to match the assumptions um, of data because it gives us a particular target that we want to hit. In our work, we specifically use data collected by Christopher Manser and Boris Gansicki and their observations of the mass, temperature, and radius of the white dwarf. Those, that information was found um, using optical spectroscopy, instruments such as the Hubble Space Telescope and the Very Large Telescope. I've created a table up in the corner, that's a section of the table that I used, that just organizes all the information into one area, and we use this as input into our MESA model. These numbers are approximately what you'd see in a hydrogen-rich white dwarf. Um, most white dwarfs are about 0.6 solar masses, this one is 0.7 and it's also a little bit bigger than the, uh, than the Earth. I've also included that arrow right by log g, which is uh, the logarithm of the surface gravity. You can see here that this value is 8, which is approximately 10,000 times higher than the surface gravity of the sun, just to put into perspective how dense this object is. So current models of white dwarfs assume that diffusion is the main chemical mixing process that is taking place. The purpose of my work was to introduce something called thermohaline mixing into theor theoretical models of the white dwarf and see how this might change the total accretion rate. This idea has previously been introduced within the stellar evolution community with those works highlighting the accretion rates of white dwarfs and how this might change between standard models of gravitational diffusion and this newer idea of thermohaline mixing. However, my white dwarf system includes that planetary fragment, which allows us to draw very interesting conclusions. So I noted that I introduced something called thermohaline mixing into my models. Thermohaline mixing, which is also referred to as fingering convection, is a process in which heavier stuff on top of lighter stuff leads to a fluid instability that mixes on a thermal diffusion timescale. You can see here these little fingers that are transporting material upwards and downwards that move matter in a way that changes previous models of the white dwarf surface. So finger Fingering convection induces extra mixing of accreted material that is transported further into the white dwarf as compared to just gravitational settling. And the reason why we take thermohaline mixing into account in the first place is because our white dwarf is expected to have no surface convection zone due to its high temperature. This means that the accreted heavy elements, so anything that is not hydrogen and helium, would concentrate at the surface, which would lead to the weight gradient that I mentioned before that excites the instability. And just as a note, the haline and thermohaline refers to its saltiness. That is because this instability is well known in oceanography, um, and it occurs in situations where warm salt water lies on top of cooler fresh water. So salt doesn't refer to my work. There, there's no salt, but that's, that's where the name comes from. I've also included this image to show what thermohaline mixing looks like in our models. So the bottom plot represents the extent of thermohaline mixing in the surface layers of the white dwarf, and then the top represents the extent of metals mixing into the white dwarf. DTH, we're over there on the x-axis, that is the diffusion coefficient of thermohaline mixing, and then the, oh, y-axis, and then on the x-axis, we have the log of the exterior mass coordinate. And so basically, right here, we have the surface of the white dwarf, and then as you move that way, you're going further into the white dwarf. So in order to model all of this, I utilized an open source stellar evolution code called MESA. MESA can be used to simulate the time evolution of low and high mass stars, um, accounting for nuclear reaction rates and atmosphere boundary conditions. In our case, we used a module called STAR, which calls on other modules in order for us to simulate the white dwarf that we're looking at. And we're able to make such changes by altering inputs such as the temperature and mass of the white dwarf. So just a timeline of what my building of the white dwarf model looked like. I started by building the 0.7 solar mass white dwarf that was cooled to a temperature of approximately 20,000 Kelvin. Then I needed to find the diffusion time scales um, as well as the observed mass fractions of each element in the photosphere. Once I'd calculated these values, it was helpful for me to compare them to the calculations from Manser and Gansicki, like I mentioned just to make sure that I'm creating a white dwarf that is actually representative of the object that we're looking at. Next, I was able to combine all of that information, so the mass fractions, time scales, mass of the photosphere, uh, and that would help me find the total accretion rate, assuming that no mixing other than diffusion 
element diffusion is present. And so this is just an example of the comparisons that I would do. On the left, I have my estimated accretion rates from the MESA model. And on the right, I have Gansicki's estimated accretion rates. And so once I got my uh, calculations quite close to what has been estimated previously, I know that I can draw some conclusions from my final results once I begin to add thermohaline mixing into the picture. And so as you can see from this model, we have uh, the time evolution of mass fractions at a set accretion rate with and without thermohaline mixing. The y-axis are the elemental abundances at the surface, and then the x-axis is time. And you notice that there's a change in the period between the two plots. That is just because thermohaline mixing takes longer to reach a steady state, and I want to have a model that is a representative time scale. So I also could just edit the graph over there on the left to run for an additional thousand years, um, but it would pretty much look the same, just kind of stretched out. Um, and the, between the two figures, the plot on the right is also showing much lower values of pollution at the surface. Thermohaline changes the mass fractions by a factor of about 100. Um, and so these new values are way off from the previous estimates that I mentioned before. And so from this, we can conclude that we may need to make some changes in the accretion rate of our thermohaline models in order to bring these back numbers back up into what has been observed, uh, calculated previously. And so that was what the next section of my work was doing. I decided to create separate models for each MESA run, and this is because we were steadily changing the total accretion rate from what we found in the previous slide. So with each change, we would run uh, our MESA models and check to see if the mass fractions are matching what has been observed at the surface. And if it doesn't match, we would go back to the drawing board, increase that uh, accretion rate by a little bit more, run it again, see if it matches. And so we just in, uh, continued this process until we arrived at a calculation that did match. And so just to put that on a graph for you to show you what it looks like, um, all the lines represent the time evolution of calcium at different accretion rates. The bottommost line, that is our uh, starting point, and it's the old accretion rate solution. Once we got within that gray region, um, we knew that we were kind of close in the ballpark, and we started incrementing the accretion rate by smaller amounts. As you can see, how close the red and then those two, um, the two red and the green line are from each other. And so the black line represents the steady state value that was calculated by Gansicki, um, and then the gray box is just the uncertainty. So one thing that I found interesting is this bottommost red line, our first test, um, it's way outside of the observational uncertainty of what the accretion rate needs to be. So you can see how much we bumped it up from our second test just so we were closer to um, the expected range. So when I include thermohaline mixing, our MESA modeling of the object finds that the best match for the accretion rate is 1.8 times 10 to the 11 grams per second, which is approximately 2.8 times 10 to the minus 15 solar masses per year. This value is more than two orders of magnitude higher than what was previously inferred for this object. And so this is my final plot. Again, it's a time evolution model for thermohaline with this tuned accretion rate that we found that matches the observed mass fractions at the surface. Our goals were to determine how fast elements were sinking away from the surface and therefore what the rate of accretion was required to supply the observed pollution. In answering these questions, we found that when considering thermohaline mixing, elements are mixing inward at a rate that is faster than with just gravita gravitational settling. When just gravitational settling was accounted for, Gansicki calculated a total accretion rate of 5.6 times 10 to the 8 grams per second. So you can see the difference between the two values that we calculated. So just to summarize what I was working through this summer, Polluted white dwarfs allow us to determine the composition and structure of planetary bodies that once orbit a star. The infall from these disrupted objects is the key to answering some of the questions that we hold about planetary systems. We use theoretical modeling based on observed data to account for thermohaline mixing, which is a chemical process that is thought to take place in this white dwarf. As a result of determining the accretion rate of this material, will be able to estimate the mass of the planetesimal that supplies the polluting elements to the white dwarf, as well as just gain a better understanding of this object. I'd like to take a minute to thank my mentor, Evan, for all the encouragement that he gave me throughout the past two months. I'd also like to thank Charlie Conroy and the members of his group. They have all inspired me as a future hopeful astrophysicist. 
I'd also like to thank Matt and Jonathan for organizing and facilitating such an amazing REU program. I cannot thank you guys enough for the advice that you supplied me with. And I also want to thank all the interns here at the CFA over the summer for going through the past few weeks with me, letting me use your laptops. I enjoyed meeting all of you and wish you the best on your future endeavors. And I can't wait to see you guys uh, in January. And then finally, I'd like to thank my friends and family that are watching my presentation virtually. Your kind words and loves have helped me push through each day. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks for a great talk. Do we have any questions for Ariana? So the second is great. Does this have consequences for our or your understanding of the previous? You know, just, you're drawing, you're in more mass. Right. So too many things are lost. It's long enough to get bigger. So in this case, because we're the accretion rate is higher and we are drawing in more mass than previous models. We use that to infer that maybe the object, the planetesimal that we're looking at, is bigger than we think it is. So instead of being um, like a shard from a planet, it might be an exomoon or an exoplanet that is supplying the debris disk. Yeah. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, very nice talk, by the way. Um, so I was, I just did a little calculation, and I may have gotten it wrong, but. I think your numbers imply a, an accretion rate of something of order 200,000 tons of matter per second, uh, which seems like a lot. It's really a stupendous rate to come from one planetesimal. Right. But then uh, you did tell us at the beginning it's inside the Roche mode, yes. so um, perhaps that's reasonable. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if this implies that it really is being disrupted despite the fact that it has, um, an, despite the fact that it's an iron core right. and its lifetime around this thing is, is limited. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, the planet has, well, isn't going to orbit the, it's doomed, it's doomed essentially. Yeah. Eventually, <laughs> eventually it, it will be gone. Um, but. It's different than what we see in white dwarfs that have a debris disk and we don't, or we haven't seen an object yet that's orbiting within that debris disk. Um, so it would last a little bit longer on that time scale um, because you've got the debris disk as well as an object that is slowly disintegrating um, into, that, into that disk. So either way, it's going to eat it up, but not as quickly. Okay. Um, I, have, I have one other question. Um, so you, you mentioned calcium in particular. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if that element has like favored status or if or did you use did you apply the same um, metrics to all the elements yeah. uh, to decide on what your overall accretion rate would be? Um, so when I was testing for accretion rate I didn't single out elements in particular. That was just for making this graph so you could see what it changed like for one element. But we do see some elements that match previously calculated um, surface mass fractions better than others. So oxygen, calcium, and iron. I, my calculations and previous estimates kind of go hand in hand. Um, one element that we really had trouble with, trouble with was with carbon. Uh, even before we added thermohaline mixing into the picture, our MESA models were showing much lower levels of carbon than what was previously estimated, and so that's something that Evan and I took into account as when we go back and tune our models um, to keep an eye out for, because it was kind of strange that everything else was kind of trending in the direction of matching, um, but carbon was kind of lying low. So you can kind of tell in these plots carbon is supposed to be a little bit higher than what it is showing. And so when we added thermohaline mixing, that it didn't get better. So it's still a little bit lower than previous estimates. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So question over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I imagine this type of modeling is pretty unforgiving um, with errors and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> Were you, did you run into any issues with trying to run something at such a large time scale? Yeah. So <laughs> I mentioned that I used other people's computers just because um, when I was running my MESA models, so a MESA model with just diffusion taking place for half a year, I don't think it even took 20 minutes. 
But then when I added thermohaline mixing into the equation and then I asked it to run for a thousand years, Mesa didn't really like that, which is understandable because it's running so many equations of state and things like that at little increments of time. Um, so I was taking time steps, I think a bit of a few days, but Mesa wasn't listening to me and was taking time steps of a little bit less than a day. And so eventually my models would take 24 hours to run. Um, but that kind of helped in a way that if I did a run and it was taking more than 24 hours, then I was a little bit suspicious about maybe I did something wrong. And so I was able to maybe pause that run, go back and check my inputs. And there were a couple times where I noticed that I overestimated what I thought the accretion rate would be. And so that's why it was taking way, way longer than it should be. So it was long in general, but I was able to use other people's uh, things and just wait it out and it worked okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this this object, this source of the material, yes. it's actually pretty close to the white dwarf. Yes. It yeah. clearly wasn't there during the pre-white dwarf phase. Yes. So yeah. there must have been some interesting evolution in the meantime, mm -hmm. living close. Yeah. Um, there was actually a talk by Andrew Vanderberg here at the CFA that explained it a little bit better, but I do have a graphic. So kind of in a solar system, when the star essentially explodes, the outer layers expand, and it becomes a white dwarf. Um, like in our solar system, for example, Earth may or may not be safe from this explosion, um, but uh, planets that are further away usually can survive. But the change in the density and the strong gravitational field of the white dwarf does cause some objects to scatter. And so I know that Evan kind of painted a picture of um, a planet that changes the, its orbit around the white dwarf, and maybe goes from out here and comes close enough and loops until the strong gravity of the white dwarf kind of holds it in its, um, in its tidal radius. So if this were like a comet that was flying by, it would fly through and immediately be disrupted. But if it was something bigger, the crust and the mantle might break off and then leave the core that is orbiting in its tidal radius. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, let's, <clears throat> let's thank Ariana for a great talk. <laughs> and next we're going to hear from Rachel Hemmer of Brown University. I'm Rachel Hemmer. I'm a rising senior at Brown University concentrating in astrophysics, and my research interests are all things galaxy clusters. And I've been working as an RU intern here for the past 10 weeks, and I'm here to talk to you about the uncertainty in atomic data and its impact on X-ray spectroscopy as applied to the upcoming PRISM mission. So for a little bit of context, in 2016, uh, the Hitomi satellite was launched, and it had an unprecedented, like, high-resolution capabilities for X-ray spectroscopy. It has a resolving power of about R1250, an effective area of 210 centimeters squared, which can be compared to the next best instrument, um, the Chandra CCD with the spectrum grading, which has a resolving power of about 1,000, but an effective area of only 7 centimeters squared. So, before Hitomi was launched, um, a lot of our spectrums in the x-rays looked like this red line. This is the Suzaki spectrum. Um, so you can get some resolved features, but not many. But as you can see, the black spectrum with Hitomi, you can get significantly better resolution. Um, 
Unfortunately, in 2016, uh, we lost contact with the Xiaomi, but in 2023, uh, JAXA and NASA will be launching um, CRISM, the X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission, uh, which will have the same resolving power and is nearly the same instrument as the Xiaomi and its picture there. So before Hitomi was lost, uh, we collected a, a spectrum of the Perseus galaxy cluster, pictured here with Chandra in the x ray um, And the reason we did this is because galaxy clusters, as the most massive gravitationally bound objects in the universe, are really good probes of cosmology and can be used as sort of cosmological simulations, as they're large sources of dark matter, and they're really integral to identifying the large portion of uh, dark energy in the universe. But these analyses require using proxies to get the mass of that cluster, which in turn requires an understanding of how energy is being injected into that system. So Hitomi was aiming to obtain this knowledge from the turbulent velocity and resonance scattering ring profiles of the intracluster medium within that galaxy cluster. Right. However, you may be wondering, once you have a spectrum, of this plasma. How do you get a result from that? So what we use is collisional plasma modeling techniques. Uh, the two most common are SPECS and APEC. Um, and how they work is they're going to model an optically thin astrophysical plasma, uh, the continuum emission process that that has, and the line emission processes that that has. Um, so what that really means is they take a really large amount of fundamental atomic data from lab experiments and theoretical calculations put it into a model of a plasma, and then simulate what a spectrum from that plasma would look like at a given temperature, metallicity, velocity, et cetera. And then it compares to the observed spectrum, and then tweaks the physical parameters until you get a pretty good match. So shown here is my fit of the Hitomi spectrum in the 6.4 to 6.7 kilo electron volt range. Um, And you can see it models it pretty well. We have a nice fit. And uh, the lines in this energy range that are going to be the most relevant are the iron-25 helium-like complex and the iron-24 lines, which you can't visibly see, but they're there. Uh, so we have um, the resonance line, which is this W line here, the forbidden line, which is this Z line, the Y line and the X line, as those features there in the spectrum. And we also have the uh, five iron 24 lines, Q, R, S, T, and U, um, which uh, these letters are just designations given to the lines to keep track of them all. So we fit a model that first accounted for foreground absorption column density and then modeled uh, the processes of the plasma in the Perseus galaxy cluster and measured a temperature, iron abundance, velocity broadening, and then we also accounted for the resonance scattering ratio, um, which is because the resonance or the W line there, as you can see, is so many photons that the plasma begins to become optically thick and reabsorb some of those photons. So we added a negative Gaussian component to our model to account for that decrease in the W line. However, if you do the same modeling with specs, you get some different results, which isn't ideal. <laughs> um, so here you can see one of the ways that you're going to get um, measurements of physical parameters is looking at how much those lines are emitting, the distance between those lines, and the ratios between those lines. And the, measured, and the temperature as a function of the resonance to forbidden line ratio between the two models is noticeably different. <laughs> and over here we have... Um, a visualization of the effective collision strength uh, for different models as a function of temperature, and you can see that they're starting to diverge pretty dramatically. Um, and the reason this wasn't identified before is with the increase in resolution, um, these disagreements are now quite outside of instrumentation error, whereas previously the disagreements between models were always within the instrumentation error. So the reason I'm focusing on the iron complex is because the measured iron abundance between the APEC model results and the SPECS model results differed by about 17 sigma. We also had some pretty significant uh, disagreements 
in turbulent velocity measurements, resonance scattering ratio, and other elemental abundances. They varied a little in temperature, but not as much. And the reason we think that there are these disagreements is the fundamental atomic data, because uh, we don't know which set of atomic data these models are using are correct, if any. Um, and the specific points of atomic data I will be focusing on are the Einstein A coefficient um, and the electron excitation rate. As you can see in this animation here, the electron excitation rate is when in this collisional plasma, an electron comes in, hits an iron atom, and excites the electron up. The Einstein A coefficient is that spontaneous de excitation back down, which is when the photon gets emitted. So, and in this table, we have an estimate of the difference uh, in the Einstein A coefficient and the electron excitation rate for all of these iron lines I've been talking about between APEC and SPECS. And that leads to what my project is going to be focusing on, which is that we have this high resolution spectrum and we're expecting an influx of more at the launch of CRISM. And we need to understand the modeling better to get results we can really trust and have these results come into agreement. So I investigated the impact of varying the fundamental atomic data on the physical results put into, that come out of the APEC model. So the way you can do this is using the uh, variable APEC code available, which allows you to go in to the calculations, change the Einstein A coefficient or the electron collision coefficient, and recalculate any emissivity. So this is sort of a visualization of what that process looks like over a pretty wide range of temperatures um, for the iron 25 lines, just because they're more visible. So you can see that changing um, these atomic processes gives you pretty different um, emissivities of these lines. And then when you put, then put that into determining ratios of strength and distances and all of those things, they start changing a lot. And you're going to be getting different results. So my process was, you start <laughs> with um, taking that estimated error between the APEC and SPECS model on each atomic process for each line and modeling that as a Gaussian distribution where the standard deviation is that difference. And then you go through, we had to do one process at a time. So I first focused on the Einstein A coefficient and then the electron excitation rate. Um, for each line, randomly sample a factor by which to vary it from that original value. Repeat for the atomic process of interest on all of the lines. Recalculate the emissivities over 2.1 to 6.8 kilo electron volt temperature range, which is a pretty reasonable estimate so that you're getting the range of possible values, but your model isn't going to run into like a cliff and not be able to fit. Um, generate a new emissivity file for the APEC model. Feed that in to APEC uh, and refit the Perseus spectrum that we have. Compare the measured physical parameters to the original best fit. And then we can repeat that process with um, the other atomic uh, process. And from there, we'll be able to see how much the atomic data is going to affect the measured physical results of our, of our galaxy cluster. So here's a visualization of all of the models that came out of that process. So we have the, um, our 6.4 to 6.7 uh, kilo electron volt energy range. And the gray X's here are the data from Hitomi of the Perseus cluster. And we have counts per second on our Y axis. And all of these colorful lines are the different models that I created with the varied atomic data. So you can see that they're agreeing pretty well on the resonance line here. But as you go into the intercombination, and especially the forbidden line, they vary pretty significantly in what results you're getting out of them. And what I then did was investigate uh, which physical parameters are sensitive to which atomic data, which is, for example, if you vary this physical parameter, or, uh, the temperature has a noticeable correlation with how much that physical parameter is changing. But down here, the velocity isn't really affected by that value. So I wanted to investigate which atomic processes are most important in determining the outcomes of your modeling. So I found um, that the Einstein A coefficient on the W line for I-25 was correlated to our measured temperature and iron abundance in the Perseus galaxy cluster. 
the Einstein A coefficient on the Y line is correlated with the measured iron abundance. The electron excitation rate on the Z line is correlated with the measured velocity broadening. And the electron excitation rate on the W line is correlated with the measured temperature and iron abundance. And then I looked at just over the range of all of these varied atomic data, what was the like overall standard deviation range of uh, physical parameters of the perceived galaxy cluster that came out of that? I looked at the standard apex value and the specs value that came out of those original calculations. And you can see that the difference in atomic data really does look like it's explaining um, the difference between the modeling results, which is really motivating the need for more accurate atomic data and a better way to account for the effect the atomic data has in these calculations. Um, I'm also interested for further investigation, the resonance scattering effect, uh, which is, if you recall, in that big W line, some of those photons being reabsorbed, uh, has a pretty big difference based on the atomic data with no clear correlation. So I'm really interested in looking into that further. Yeah, to conclude, um, the upcoming PRISM mission means we have a lot of high resolution spectrum incoming and we're going to need accurate modeling to get really good results from all of that exciting spectrum. Um, and we found that the atomic data put into these models can affect and account for uh, the differences between these models. Uh, specifically, the Einstein A coefficient on the Y and W line and the electron excitation rate on the Z and W line. And further work I'm going to be pursuing is updating the code to be able to vary those coefficients separately at the same time and investigating the, the um, effect of the resonance scattering a little further. And hopefully, if more data comes in from PRISM, we'll be able to look into this effect in other objects. So yeah, thank you. Do we have any questions for Rachel? Charlie. I realize this might be outside of what you worked on, but do you have a sense of um, how we can get better measurements of these atomic parameters? So you show that they matter and they're quite uncertain, but what can we do in the future? Oh, um, that's a great question. It's pretty hard to get these atomic measurements, which is why there's so much uncertainty, just because to get a good measurement of this atomic process, you need iron-24 or iron-25, which requires temperatures of like 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 Kelvin to really get an accurate measurement. So it is going to be pretty difficult to get atomic data, but I don't have a great answer as to how to improve it. This is related to Charlie's question. I'm actually shocked that you can't calculate an Einstein A coefficient for helium-like iron um, in, the, in, the, in this century while we're spending more than half a billion dollars on prism. It's a relatively simple, I mean, we, we understand the, the basic structure of the spectrum pretty well, but the details are not more challenging than I would have imagined. I'm not entirely sure what goes into that calculation. I don't know. We're either. doing it empirically. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to learn more about the Einstein coefficient from the X-ray observation the first time. <laughs> well, I, I had a related question. I, well, I don't know, if, is, is there anybody who can answer Charles' question first? But well, yes, I mean, he's right. I mean, the A-bodies are pretty accurate, but the main, uh, the main problem in doing this, uh, this modeling is the familiar calculations of the study. And typically, the forbidden lines in the past have always been uh, underestimated because uh, you, need, uh, you need complex uh, you know, matrix calculations and typically you have to have large models and uh, the resonances pump up this, this, these rates. So there are, you know, so older, older um, atomic databases use more simplified calculations and typically there is a big change. And, uh, but yes, I mean, they are used to be 
they are less uncertain than those 20 percent. So, you know, I had a question, you know, how did you get that? So I estimate that was it by comparing different uh, calculations? Yeah. Uh, and then, which is something I've, I've done in the past, you know, when we run different calculations and, you know, change the input and then, uh, and then you have an idea of how um, so each of the rates changes. Is that what you think? Uh, for these estimates of how much I was going to vary at them, the W, X, Y, and Z are directly the difference in the APEC and SPEX databases. That's why uh, that 42% uh, for the electronic citation rate on the forbidden line is a pretty big difference. For the iron 24 lines, there wasn't great information available on that, so we went with a reasonable estimate that would cover a pretty wide range. I don't know. So one way to think of this is those estimates for the Q3 new lines are way too big and the Z line Q error is also too large. However, the idea is just to create a sensitivity block. You can see which ones it's sensitive to and how much, even if the absolute values are wrong. That, that's the goal. So I had a question about um, from my naive perspective as an outsider, because I'm an infrared astronomer, I would imagine since, um, based on your talk, I anticipate um, in my ignorance that there's going to be a flood of infrared spectra coming soon that's going to define, that could allow you the opportunity to, to attack this problem not in this rather data limited mode with one spectrum to model, but thousands of spectra, potentially. Um, and so you could, um, you would have all kinds of physical conditions for different clusters. Or, um, would it be hard for you to adapt your code if you were interested in? It would be very those? easy to run this on another object. Yeah. to the slide where you're looking at all the correlations between tuning the different rooms, right, so the, the third one point, I believe. Um, so I was just wondering, do you know what's going on in this bottom right, which just suddenly blows up? Uh, yeah, this is, is quite dramatic. Yeah, this is the uh, one with that 42% difference, and I'm worried a little bit as to getting out into this range that something is going a little wrong here. Okay. Uh, so I am planning to look into that further as I narrow down on my results in future work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, let's thank Rachel again. So we're going to take a little break here. I'm just going to check my notes. Uh, we'll reconvene at 11.20. Okay. We're taking a 10-minute break.
Phil just turns on the mic He's totally good with that. So we should do it. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Courtney Guerrero from Johns Hopkins, who's going to tell us about how giant molecular clouds work. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Matt said, my name is Courtney Carrera. I'm a rising senior at Johns Hopkins University. And this summer, the central question that I wanted to answer was, do spiral arms form molecular clouds? This was a totally new research topic to me. In the past, I've done some work more computationally with white dwarfs that may host exoplanets and with simulations of supernovae. So I was coming into this totally fresh, not having much of a background. So I'm going to walk you through today a little bit of what I learned along the way and the process that I underwent for this project. So we start uh, talking about spiral arms and molecular clouds and all of these things really at the biggest scale, which is galactic environments. And did I put this picture in the presentation because it's very pretty? Yes. Uh, <laughs> this is a grand design spiral galaxy, M74. And not only is it a very pretty picture, and we can see all these beautiful details, thank you JWST, uh, but I think what's actually really impactful and important to notice here is the spiral structure of the galaxy. When I look at this, I see that spiral structure clearly matters. There's a lot you can see. The arms are well-defined. There's all these bubbles and different features. So I think uh, the kind of takeaway and how this becomes a launching point for my project is that the galactic environment on a macro scale clearly is having an effect on small features within the galaxy because of this spiral structure. And so we take that and we start looking at some actual models. Um, the kind of foremost model that we're going to talk about in relation to spiral arms and molecular clouds is the Roberts model from 1969. So this was a theory that basically said that the movement of spiral arms causes essentially this, this kind of a process where the interstellar medium is gathered upstream of a spiral arm and then it becomes uh, more dense and forms molecular gas as the spiral arm passes through it. And essentially, that kind of shock formation causes atomic gas to become molecular gas, which then can be deposited downstream of the arm and form the basis of star-forming regions. So that's kind of seen here in this artist's rendition, uh, where you can see the H2 regions and newly born stars are kind of downstream of the arm as it loops around. And it's seen also here on this side in kind of an unwrapped form. So the shock causes this large spike in the density of the gas that then decreases and happens again when the next... Uh, spiral arm moves through. So the central takeaway of the Roberts model is that the spiral arm causes a shock density wave which compresses nearby gas and then potentially triggers molecular cloud formation. Um, so this is a really interesting model and it's formed the basis of a lot of the theory around molecular cloud formation ever since it was published. But it's not necessarily something that has been really directly observed or studied in all that much detail in part because there wasn't necessarily the observational capacity to do so. But now, we're at the point where we can. Um, so we wanted to study this summer uh, to see if this trend would bear out in observations. So to do that, we have to first find something to look at. Um, so we, saw, we studied a region in M33, which is a nearby face-on spiral galaxy. It provides the perfect opportunity. We can get really good high-resolution observations of M33 and also have the face-on view that allows us to see the trends forming around the positioning of molecular gas and the spiral arms themselves. So we have this region, which is highlighted in the yellow box, in the southeast spiral arm. That is 1.2 kiloparsec squared in, region, in, in area. Um, and it has part of a spiral arm cutting through it that is more or less defined by the old stellar population. So we observed this area and are essentially uh, looking at the variety of molecular gases and atomic gas in this area to see how they are trending in, with proximity to the spiral arm. So now we know what we want to look at, and we have to figure out what we're looking for. So we're going to talk about molecular gas tracers. Um, so we have a, a variety of different tracers that we looked at in this study, from atomic gas, H1, all the way up to higher density molecular gases like HCO+. And there's a few interesting things happening with the selection of these tracers. 
namely that as from bottom to top, as you see here, they increase in density. So we can maybe see that shock formation density wave occurring by observing trends in something that is lower density, like atomic gas, into something much higher in gas species density, like HCO+. But the other factor that we're balancing here is that the surface brightness of these gases decreases uh, in relation to its density. So the HCO plus observations, for example, are much fainter and harder to see. Um, and so we're kind of trying to balance our ability to see things like atomic gas, which we want, and then also have something like HCO plus so we can observe these trends in relation to the density of the molecular gas itself. Um, so now we can kind of look, just like as a general picture, of what these observations are kind of shaping out to be. So in this image, we have the log spiral arm of the galaxy cutting through in white. Uh, and then atomic gas is in red, 12CO in blue, 13CO, 2 to 1 in yellow. Um, and I think what's most important to point out in this image in particular is the markings that indicate upstream and downstream of the arm, because that's kind of going to end up being relevant throughout the, prop, the presentation. Um, upstream is indicated by the arrow and downstream, as you can see. Um, and so we need to kind of set this spatial understanding of the region so we can uh, later come back to this idea of about trends across the arm. How is material moving from upstream across the arm and then ends up downstream? So just keep this image in mind throughout the rest of the presentation. And also just to show you, uh, I can show you the other tracers that we have in this region. So 12CO is still in blue. Now we have 13CO 1 to 0, a different transition in green, and HCO plus in purple. Um, so you can, you know, get a sense of where these things are kind of lining up. So uh, we have all these observations, which we're interested in analyzing. But some of them look like this, <laughs> which is not necessarily all that helpful to us. This is a sample spectrum of, from our HCO plus observation. Um, and as you can see, uh, there really isn't an obvious detection here. <laughs> it's rather noisy and, you know, for lack of a better word, uninformative to us in this state. But let's say that we were able to take something like this and get out information that looked more like this. So here we have the same observation. This is still the HCO plus observation. But we've applied what we call spectral line stacking to recover the faint emission that was not present in the noisy sample spectrum but is present here. So the process of spectral line stacking is fairly straightforward. Essentially, you are aligning the spectrum to a common velocity map to get everything kind of in the same frame of reference, if you will. And then you're averaging all the spectra in the channel based on how it's now been realigned. So because you're averaging across all these different spectra, you are losing spatial information. But in what you get out of it at the end of the day is a spectrum that has a really much boosted SNR. So the noise, as you can see here, has been damped down quite dramatically in comparison to some of the sample spectra that I was showing earlier. So this is great. This is like, this is wonderful. We now have a detection. We have something that we can do something with to begin, you know, really getting into the meat of this project. But we can do better. Uh, so then we do a little bit more manipulation of our spectral observations. And so what I did is apply a mask to the spectra, spectra that we had wherein I basically said um, we had, based on our original or kind of raw observations, we had moment maps that were supplied that basically indicate where there is any kind of detection. And so what I found was really helpful in terms of taking that detection and even more increasing our SNR um, is by applying the moment map as a mask of sorts to the spectra that are being inputted into the spectral line stacking process we can essentially uh, remove spectral channels that are uninformative, places that don't have detections, um, and instead now just average across things that we, we know exist um, and we know are helpful to us. So the difference here is really, really lovely. And now this is something I feel better about working with. <laughs> and so now we can take that, uh, and spectra are, of course, fantastic, but we want to have some actual tangible numbers associated with it. So what we do is we can fit each of these detections with a Gaussian, where it, which is kind of well-funded in the literature as a reasonable fit, wherein the width of the Gaussian is approximately equal to the line width of the detection, which is a measure of the velocity dispersion, the kind of turbulence associated with the detection. So now, what I've kind of talked through is that we have spectra that are awesome and have been cleaned up nicely, 
and we have numbers associated with them, but we still need to get back to this idea of proximity to the spiral, and that's the kind of, again, the central question that we're coming back to with this project. So we need to understand how we can map distance from the spiral arm. So what I essentially did was apply a kind of binning process to our observations, wherein I made bins of approximately 70 parsecs in width, more or less equivalent to the resolution of the observations that we had. And I kind of bin them as contours that mimicked the arc of the log spiral arm um, to basically say, you know, we have whatever spectra in this particular region, let's average just those things together. So we end up with one stacked spectrum per distance bin, and it can go both upstream and downstream of the arm. So you can kind of see the contours represented by these dashed white lines. So with all of this, we now have one spectrum per distance bin that we've cleaned up in a certain way, and we can get some actual numbers out of it. So with this, we can create some tracer profiles to show the trend across the arm. And those are kind of the main results that I want to share with all of you. So uh, this is the first kind of tracer profile that I thought would be interesting to show. Um, what we have here is showing the uh, ratio of the H2 proportion, which is kind of a, you can take our observations of Tulsio and apply a certain scaling factor to it, um, uh, divided by the proportion of atomic gas H1. So essentially, this ratio provides us some indication of what our enhancement in molecular gases in comparison to the atomic gas in the region. And what we were really excited to see is that there's seemingly this kind of peak of sorts about the spiral arm, which is indicative of some level of consistency with the Roberts model. It's showing that there is a, an increased kind of efficiency in H2 formation about the spiral arm, so molecular gas is definitely more concentrated about the arm. Um, now, you may notice this lovely purple box, <laughs> uh, which is kind of an artifact of an inaccurate detection that we... We, we, we saw this and we were like, oh my gosh, there's so much molecular gas downstream of the arm, and it was very exciting. Uh, but we actually have since kind of done some further investigation and think that is actually just an inaccurate detection. So throughout the next few slides, you'll see this purple box showing up a couple times. Those are detections that probably aren't actually detections. Um, so uh, now we can move on to a few other results. So as I mentioned before, we have the Gaussian fit associated with each spectra or spectrum, and uh, by integrating under the curve, you can get a value for the integrated intensity of that detection. And I think what's the most important to point out here, so the, the plots are orient, kind of structured in such a way that you go from in, increasing density up and then over and then up again, if you will, acknowledging that 13CO2 to 1 and 13CO1 to 0 are just different transitions. Um, but what we are kind of seeing, essentially, is that more dense uh, molecular gases, you know, 12CO certainly, 13CO, 13CO uh, in each of its transitions, and HCO plus, do experience an increase in their in intensity, increase in their abundance, really, uh, about the spiral arm. And that is promising. That is, again, indicative of some level of consistency with the model that was theorized by Roberts. Um, we are also seeing, I think it's worth pointing out, I pretty kind of carefully and, and manually investigated the different distance bins and spectrum associ spectra associated with each one for the 12 co observation. So that artifact incorrect in detection, uh, detection is highlighted in purple there in that one particular distance bin, but I actually am fairly certain that this is a clean detection. Um, so I think we can also say from this, though, subject to a little bit more evaluation based on that detection problem, um, I think it is actually also safe to say that the 12CO and 13CO to some extent do also have stronger uh, intensities downstream of the arm, which provides even more uh, kind of c consistency and results in tandem with the Roberts model to show that molecular gases are seemingly being deposited downstream of the arm. So that's also exciting to see. Um, and we can kind of go through this again with the line width, which as I mentioned, is uh, a measure of the di velocity dispersion of the gases and kind of correlated with the turbulence. Um, so here, I think what I would like to point out in particular is that the 12CO and 13CO in each of its transitions do also experience this kind of peak, if you will, about the spiral arm. Um, and that is also exciting. It, I think, indicates that there is some kind of interaction that's occurring with the spiral arm um, where there's an, an energy transfer of, of some kind or another. So the velocity dispersion peaking in those areas, in particular knowing the location of the spiral arm, I think indicates that there's something interesting going on there. 
that trend, if you will, is not necessarily borne out in the HCO plus observation. It does decrease a little bit just prior to the arm. That's, you know, room for further investigation as I see it. <laughs> um, so with all that said, here are some of my conclusions. So again, our, our kind of central question is, do spiral arms form molecular clouds? So I think what we've shown is some level of consistency with the Roberts model that was originally theorized, in which we find more dense molecular gases are deposited at the arm and, to some extent, downstream of the arm. And the line widths of the tracers are peaking about the spiral arm. So there's some kind of turbulence relationship happening at the spiral arm, in all likelihood. Um, those trends are not necessarily conclusive. As you saw, you know, there, there are peaks, but they're not necessarily super strong peaks where we can say, like, yes, we've done exactly what Roberts hoped we would find. Um, but we do think that these trends are very suggestive of something interesting happening here that is at the very least consistent with the Roberts model, maybe not necessarily confirming the Roberts model. So this is a project that I have found very interesting in no small part because there's a lot of room for further development and study with it. Um, and speaking of, so we have, you know, further analysis is hopefully going to attempt to validate some of the results that are suggested here. I'd like to specifically highlight the simulations done by Gorak Rajesh, who has been working concurrently with my, one of my advisors, Sarah, um, this summer on simulations kind of looking at a, a similar process in Milky Way-like galaxies. So I'd like to highlight that work. Um, but yeah, so that, that is what I was up to this summer. Um, and I'd like to quickly take this opportunity to thank Eric and Sarah, my advisors, who were really phenomenal in teaching me a lot about this topic and guiding me this summer, and also everyone in the Goodman Research Group um, and Gorak for working with me, and perhaps most importantly of all, Matt and Jonathan for organizing this whole REU and making it such an, a phenomenal experience, not only for me, but for all the interns. So thank you. All right, thank you for a great talk. Um, do we have any questions for Courtney? Yes. Um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, nice talk. I uh, had a question about how you find the position of the spiral arms. Uh, looking at that first image, yes. to me, I really couldn't see the, the, you know, the obvious strong spiral arms, but are you, yeah, so that nice white line you show going through there, is yes. that defined by the, you know, the warm dust emission or is it stellar density? Or how, how do you actually locate where the spiral arm is? So that is based on uh, the approximate location of the old stellar population um, and the Spiral arm is something that we can we can have a long conversation about because it is definitely room, an area where there is a room for improvement with this study. Um, we I had kind of extensive conversations with Eric about this in that sometimes there are papers where people just kind of like draw where they think the spiral arm is and they're like, okay, that's the spiral arm. Um, and so we were attempting to apply a log spiral arm model that would kind of more algorithmically do that process where it uh, included a lot of input parameters about the galaxy itself. Um, based on some packages that Eric was part of writing and uh, outputted what you see as the white line here. Um, so that is, uh, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but. I guess you said it on your slide, it's the old stellar population. Yes. So you looked at images, optical images, and measured the stellar density and figured out where the peak was and who they are in the moment. Yes. yes. There must be some sort of averaging where it's a nice smooth line, where it's the actual you see right, yes, this kind of smooths it out to where the, the line actually has a width that isn't necessarily displayed here, so it's based on the Gaussian width profile, but yes. Melissa? Can you say something about where these lovely data came from and how much more of it there is than what we see on the slide here, if there is more? So uh, all of the, we use, a, there's a variety, all the observations that we used came from several years um, some of it comes from uh, the ACA at ALMA, NOEMA, um, Argus at GBT, what am I forget, EVLA. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, data that we had to pull from. Um, and all of the, well, just, to, just because you asked, Alyssa, I will also mention that these visualizations were made in glue. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just want to know, is the field of view bigger than this? The field, so the field of view. Are these all the clouds that you have, or there's more than what you see on the screen? Um, in terms of what I was given, I believe these are basically all the clouds that we have. Um, we do 
have, we, we did also kind of do a process, which I didn't talk about in this presentation, of analyzing like discrete giant molecular clouds. Um, that field of view actually I think is slightly smaller than what I display here, um, because the NOEMA field of view is smaller and that's where some of those cloud catalogs come from. Um, but in terms of what I was given to work with, this should be everything. <laughs> Yes, although I don't know if we're over time. I'm seeing well, that we I'm way over. Take one last question. Okay, yes, go ahead. This is a little unfair for Ryan to see me. Why is progress so slow in this area? Well, <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> um, I think progress being slow. That's that feels like. I don't want to just say that as a as a general rule, but um, I think that there maybe wasn't necessarily uh, as much interest in, in analyzing some of these fields very early on. Roberts was kind of one of the main people looking into this um, for a long time there. Um, I do think in, in recent years it's become a much more kind of pervasive and uh, widespread field of study in no small part because of people like Alyssa and my advisor Eric, who's part of the FANGS collaboration, does a lot of work um, looking at the interstellar medium in kind of wider um, fields of view and, and trying to see it at very small scales. Um, so I don't necessarily know why there was kind of this lull for some amount of time where we still have this model from 50 years ago <laughs> um, that has kind of formed the, the basis of this study. But I do think that there's certainly a, an increased interest in it now, and I think a lot of the more modern observational facilities are allowing work like this to continue at really uh, tremendous pace. Let me add like five words: crappy resolution and constantly contradictory results. That also is true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's thank Courtney again. Oh, taking your weapon. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, you've got your. Uh, All right. So you're taking it here from Theo and Neil. University of Virginia. Let me set you up here. Oh, good. Um, so, as Matt said, I'm Theo O'Neill. I'm a rising senior at the University of Virginia, where I'm studying astrophysics and statistics. Um, and this summer, I've been working with Alyssa Goodman and Jesse Hahn on a project um, to create a three-dimensional map of magnetic fields over the surface of the local bubble. And before I get started in full, um, I wanted to share, again, <laughs> this fabulous JWST image that our previous speaker had the same great idea to share. <laughs> Um, and so while Courtney was interested in the spiral structure in this image, which is fabulous, today what I'll be talking about are these kind of circular voids that we see throughout the image, which we think are examples of phenomena called super bubbles. So super bubbles result when multiple supernova go off in sequence in a relatively contained area, and in the process of that um, explosion, kind of push out all the dust and gas in a region to create a large underdense area, and in the process, trigger star formation through their expansion. And the nearest superbubble to us is the very creatively named local bubble. So about 14 million years ago, not too far from the present day location of our sun, this process where a stage of supernova went off began to occur, and through that expansion, which is being shown in this lovely movie here, um, it triggered star formation in a lot of nearby regions, like Taurus, for example, that have been studied for decades um, as examples of nearby star formation. And there's a lot of outstanding questions in how do superbubbles work, what is the local bubble really doing in these areas, but one of the most interesting is how magnetic fields interact with superbubbles in general. Um, and I know, you know, magnetic fields, the kind of like boogeyman of astronomy. <laughs> um, but so what I'm showing here, are some results from previous studies. So on the left and in the center are two-dimensional slices of 3D simulated super bubbles. And what we're seeing, um, so on the left, for example, the bottom corner here 
is showing this expanding super bubble. As it expands, it's expanding into this previously uniform magnetic field and distorting and wrapping around the field lines through that process. The center is showing a similar result. So there's many bubbles in this image, but for example here, there's a large underdense region with very little magnetic field strength surrounded by a thin shell of stronger material. So simulations have been great for being able to see 3D structure. Unfortunately, in terms of the observational side of things, we've been limited to what we can see on the plane of the sky, so only in two dimensions. An example of that is here. Um, with the local bubble, though, because we're inside of it, we have an advantage, and we can figure out its 3D structure. Um, and so some great work has been done in this field previously. Two examples are here. Um, so these top images are showing in the northern and southern, northern, southern caps of the local bubble Stokes parameters, so showing linear polarization components. And this bottom image here, it's a kind of unwrapped 2D version over galactic coordinates of the average angle of polarization on sky. Um, and these are fantastic, but these studies have been limited um, through no fault of their own because we didn't have a great understanding of the exact geometry of the local bubble. But fortunately for us, or you know, fortunately for me, in the last two or three years since this study, there's been a revolution in the field of 3D dust mapping. Um, so this is a process where we can combine um, Gaia or what have you, parallaxes, so distances with stellar catalogs and create a really phenomenally detailed three-dimensional map of the structure and amount of dust in the nearby interstellar medium. And so it's two-dimensional slices of that of a 3D map are being shown in these three images. So the black gray images are showing um, dust extinction at given positions with the sun at the center. And what's over plotted here in black around these surfaces is a really precise 3D model of the local bubble um, created in 2020 um, by Pelgrims and his group. And so what we're doing with this project is taking this fantastic map, which I've shown in 3D here on the right, to create a true three-dimensional map of magnetic fields over the surface of the local bubble, which will be the first time that this has been done for any observed bubble, but we're particularly happy to be able to have this detailed geometric information. So we, the heart of this analysis is based around looking at some Planck dust polarization data, which is shown here on the right. Um, so this is showing total intensity of this polar polarization data. The galactic plane is here in the center. Um, and we make two main assumptions to be able to use this map for our analysis. So first, we're assuming that outside of the galactic plane itself, the local bubble is the dominant source of polarization between us along the line of sight. Um, and we can make this assumption because, as I showed in the previous slides of the simulations, as bubbles expand, they push out most of the dust in a given region and remove you know, most of the material that could cause polarization. Uh, so this is a simple assumption, but not a terrible one. The second assumption that we make is that the 3D magnetic fields near the bubble are tangent to its surface. And again, that comes from the simulated results, where as the bubble expands, the field lines get all tangled up and covered over the surface of the bubble. So I've made some cartoons here for you guys um, showing how we convert from the Planck polarization data to an inferred plane of sky magnetic field. So shown in the left, the plane of sky is by this little blue box. The black vector is showing the angle of polarization on sky that comes from dust polarization data. Now, since we're looking at dust, thermal radiation, and the long axes of dust grains are generally aligned perpendicular to the plane of sky component and magnetic fields in a given region, the polarization that we see from this type of emission is also perpendicular to the um, polarization on sky. So the bottom here is showing, again, in the plane of sky, but rotated by 90 degrees, our inferred magnetic field. And shown here, another cartoon um, with that same plane of sky magnetic field from the previous slide in the bottom, which is just our view on sky, compared to a you know, fantastical side view along the line of sight. Um, so we're here to um, the pink plane shows uh, the surface of the local bubble at a given point. The pink plane is tangent to the surface um, at that point under our assumptions. And the blue line in that top cartoon there represents this 
2D square, but turned by 90 degrees to be perpendicular to the line of sight. And so we think that because um, we are assuming that the magnetic field is confined to that pink surface, um, the plane of sky black solid vector we see there is just a 2D projection of what's truly a three-dimensional vector shown here by the dashed lines in the plane of the sky. So by combining our geometry, the local bubble, from dust mapping with the Planck data, we can create a true set of 3D vectors over the bubble surface um, to create a map. And so that's what's shown here. So over on the left, the black vectors show over the full surface of the bubble its inferred magnetic field orientation. On the right is the same data, but represented by streamlines, which are the reflective surfaces, and they're just generated by integrating over that 3D vector space. And right away, we can see some pretty interesting behavior over the surface of the bubble, so areas where it curves rapidly, where it's not uniform, where it changes quickly. So we go through a few um, first steps to investigate what might be going on there. So the first thing we do is actually go back to two dimensions. So we take that three-dimensional model of the bubble surface, we calculate the distance between the sun and the edge of that model at every point over the plane of the sky, and that's plotted as the yellow to red to black images underneath these 2D images. Um, and then we overplot by the kind of curvy, wavy drapery pattern, the plane of sky magnetic field. And right away, you can see a lot of areas where there's interesting associations between distance and changes in the magnetic field. So there, for example, over here, over here in the northern polar area. Um, another way of looking at this is to calculate the curvature over the 3D surface at every given point, which is shown on the left. So blue and red areas are highly curved. White are changing less. Project that back to two dimensions, and again, overplot by the wavy lines of the plane of sky magnetic field. And again, we see these regions here, for example, right in here, up here, where there appear to be associations between the two quantities. The final way that we compare these um, is by starting in two dimensions. We calculate the dispersion in the on-sky angle of the magnetic field at every point over the sky. Um, that's shown by the green here. So dark green is more dispersed, um, white is less. Then we project that back to two dimensions, which is shown over here on the left, and we see that generally the most dispersed um, magnetic fields are confined to kind of distinct, um, kind of isolated curves over the surface. So these three quantities, um, distance, curvature, and dispersion, all suggest that there's some sort of association going on between the surface of the bubble and the magnetic fields. So we do a quick sanity check um, to see if maybe our assumptions, how they're doing. Um, so we compare our results from the Planck dust polarization to back right, back, background starlight polarization. So shown on the left here is a catalog of about 4,000 stars within 500 parsecs of the sun, which is perfect for a study of the local bubble. The vectors that are plotted are their on-sky polarization angles. And then just a quick refresher, since we're looking at background starlight polarization, um, we don't need to rotate those vectors by 90 degrees um, because of the same phenomena with the dust grains. So we compare um, the on-sky polarization vectors for the stars to the surface of the bubble. So shown in this image, the red vectors show the B-field orientations for stars that are inside of the model of the bubble. The gray vectors show our magnetic field over the surface of the bubble. This image is the same, but for the stars outside of the bubble, which are now shown in blue. And then this is showing those same two plots with a nice kind of blown up inset here to compare the two a bit more easily. And what we find is that generally um, the starlight polarization vectors coming from outside of the bubble are more in agreement with the vector field on the surface of the bubble than stars that are fully inside of the bubble where the starlight does not have to pass through the dusty surface of the bubble to get to us. And since we think that surface is what is responsible for most polarization in our study, this is reassuring in terms of our assumptions. We also look at this by calculating for each of these measurements the degree of polarization. So this, um, these two plots are showing similar information, 
They're showing that stars originating inside the bubble generally have lower polarization fractions than stars that are outside the bubble. Here that's shown as a function of distance for individual stars. And here, each curve represents for a random line of sight over the sky, um, 10 degrees in diameter, we take all stars within that region and then as a function of distance, take the average um, degree of polarization along that trend. And so with both of these plots, we see starlight measurements inside of the bubble have lower polarization fractions. And in addition, as we go from the sun towards the surface of the bubble, which is marked by the squares, the increase in polarization tends to slow down and stop. And so again, this is reassuring for our assumptions. Now the final thing we do um, is compare our results of the 3D magnetic field to other recent 3D mapping of the nearby interstellar medium. And so that's shown in 2D projection here on the left and three dimensions on the right. So the kind of um, elongated rainbow colored structures like here, here, over there, are nearby dense gas and star forming regions. So Orion, for example, Pipe Nebula, um, what have you. We also show, and it'll come around in a second, right here, this green sphere is the Perseus Taurus shell, her Tau shell, which was recently um, discovered. And it's a similar but much smaller bubble um, to the local bubble itself. So it's between, as you might guess from the name, the Taurus and Perseus molecular clouds. <laughs> and we think that it also is resulting from several supernova explosions or some other form of feedback and in the process pushed out and triggered star formation in these regions. And I'll show here a close-up of the specific region. So Taurus is in red, Perseus in pink, the shell is in green. Then on the left, on the surface of the bubble, I'm again plotting curvature over the surface. On the right, I'm showing the dispersion in the plane of sky B field, as well as our 3D vectors. And we can see um, that not only is this region between the shell and the bubble highly curved, the magnetic fields in this region are also extremely um, dispersed. So this suggests, and is a preliminary result, but that some um, interaction between the Pertau shell and the local bubble um, in their joint expansions kind of into each other has resulted in the magnetic field in this region becoming distorted, becoming twisted in some way and that we might not have expected otherwise. So I'll leave you with a brief summary of our work. So we've created the first ever 3D visualization of magnetic fields over the surface of an observed superbubble. We've um, analyzed starlight polarization observations, which support that the interior of the bubble is contributing relatively low polarization um, as a whole. And then finally, we find some interesting associations between the local bubble's features on its surface, its environment in the nearby ISM, and the magnetic field overall. Happy to take any questions. Time for a few questions. Go ahead, you. Um, okay. um, very interesting. Um, the idea that there is not a strong magnetic field inside the bubble is drawn by these, these simulations, right? But then, um, from my understanding, is that outside the bubble, you have no obvious clear idea how the magnetic field might be. So the question is that uh, if you looked at uh, those stars for which there are these polarization measurements that are closer to to this to the edge of the bubble, and they should show a better agreement with your with your model rather than all the other ones which are more farther away. Uh, if you had if you had thought about this or no, we haven't, at it. but that's a great idea, and we'll definitely do that. Okay. How much uncertainty is there at each one of these little bars that you've shown on the, the map? Are they, is it like each one really precise, or should I imagine them as being? Um, I wouldn't say it's overly precise. So um, the physical map of the bubble itself in 3D has about um, 20 parsecs resolution at the most, and then the Planck map that we're working with is smoothed to about two degrees on sky. Um, so each vector, which in this image is shown to have a magnitude of about 10 parsecs, might have some wiggle room, 
in its orientation, but it shouldn't be too far off, at least under the assumptions that we're making. Jesse? Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering if we have thought of, of using the position between the outer polarization, sorry, the inner ones, um, as a proxy to measure the average thickness of the bubble at those locations. And if so, I'm going to have other conversations. We have thought of that, Jesse, and that's a great idea. <laughs> um, we haven't done it yet, surprisingly, but that's definitely on the list of next steps for this project. Um, some of the other future work will involve quantifying some of our results with these associations that we've identified, and then also applying our methods to simulated super bubbles, where we know for real what the true 3D magnetic field is, to see how well we can replicate um, those real conditions. Melissa. I'm only going to ask the hard question that somebody should ask, because I know the answer. <laughs> so how much of this is caused by just the fact that the bubble ripples in and out, and what would that pattern look like if you just had a straight field and you wrapped it over the surface of the bubble? Sorry, I didn't catch the first half of the question. Basically, what happens if you have a totally straight field mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with the structure of the bubble, and all you see is the geometry? Right. Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so we, we checked this exact question. So if we have a uniform magnetic field in 3D space that just happens to pass through the bubble, how would it look if we applied our projection methods um, and we're wrongly assuming that the magnetic fields were correlated? So I don't, unfortunately, I didn't make a backup slide for that question, and I really should have. My, my advisor should have warned me, maybe. <laughs> um, but you'll have to trust me when I say this. When we apply our projection methods, um, we don't see any of those interesting kind of ripples over the bubble surface that we've identified as tied to other quantities. So it does really just look uniform over its surface. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Theo, for a great talk. Let's thank all the morning speakers. <laughs> we just passed the top of the hour, so we're going to break for lunch now. I want to encourage people to go view the Latino Initiative Program posters in the courtyard. And particularly if people are interested in issues of structure, like we've just been treated to, and GMCs. There is one poster that's particularly relevant by Adriana Medina uh, that I would encourage you to go see. Um, so we'll reconvene here at 1.40, I think, is the time, I hope, since I wrote the schedule and I'm not on pace. Um, and we'll see you all back here then. All right.
senior at Westland, and this summer I've been working on characterizing the surface of the only known Saturnian co-orbital. So just to get started, I'm going to situate us in the outer solar system. Uh, so here we're looking at a top-down view of the solar system. Um, the axes here are in a U, so we can get a size scale. Um, and just by looking at this image of real objects detected in the outer solar system, we can get a sense of some of the major structure. So the big uh, dark ring here is the Kuiper belt, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, then interior to that, we have this less dense region. Uh, the objects in this region are called centaurs. Uh, and the reason it looks so much less dense than the Kuiper belt is because the objects here are on unstable orbits. They're being scattered by the mass of planets, and they're not able to uh, be like long-term stable in any configuration there. Then interior to the centaurs, we have Jupiter family comets. These objects are dynamically coupled with Jupiter, and they're a little bit more stable there because they're just reacting to Jupiter's gravitational force. Uh, the, there's a few reasons why we're interested in the small bodies of the outer solar system, but one of the big reasons is because both their surface and dynamics probe uh, the primordial solar system and the uh, major changes that have taken place since then. Unlike planets, they uh, do not get, have as many like small effects on the surface uh, and can be more of a probe of what was going on in the epoch of planet formation. So for this talk today, we're zooming in on one object that is a co-orbital of Saturn. So you might be familiar with the concept of co-orbitals from Jupiter's Trojans, which are shown on the left here. Uh, these orbit in the L L4 and L5 points of Jupiter, but the object that we're looking at today is actually not a Trojan, it's a horseshoe co-orbital. So its orbit is shown here. 
uh, in the co-rotating frame of Saturn. So this image is mean motion corrected for the rotation of Saturn, and we're just looking at the object's orbit relative to Saturn. So as you can see, um, throughout its orbits, it's processing relative to the position of Saturn. Each of these loops here represents like one period around the sun. So um, over many periods, it processes, and eventually uh, spells out this kind of horseshoe pattern relative to Saturn. So because of this, uh, it is able to stay in this position. For kiloyears, it will not be there forever, uh, which is a really important note. This is how we know that this object did not actually form in this location, it is only temporarily trapped with Saturn. So there are a few main questions we wanted to answer about this object. The first question is, where did 2013 BZ70, that's the name for this co-orbital, come from? And the second is, when did it arrive on its current orbit? The way we went about answering these questions is using observations from Gemini North. So we're looking at both spectroscopic and ferrometric observations of the object uh, to try to get odd surface characteristics. So first, uh, we're talking about origin. Uh, before I get too into what the surface characteristics can tell us, uh, the naive assumption about where it came from is the outer solar system. This is because uh, there's more objects there and because objects are likely to scatter in from this region. And as they're scattering in, they're dynamically likely to be captured. So about 3% of the center population, which is scattering in from the Kuiper Belt, is likely to be captured in a temporary core, uh, resonance with the giant planets uh, like the one that we see for this orbit. Uh, there are also some objects that are coming out from the asteroid belt, uh, but they're just a lot fewer in number and a lot less stable in these regions. So the naive assumption is that 2013 BZ70 came from the Kuiper belt. But we can also get this question by looking at the spectral type of the object. This is because different regions of the solar system display different spectral types. So on this image, we're looking at a color-color diagram of different asteroids um, and TNOs. So the orange and blue dots represent TNOs. Those are Kuiper Belt objects, while the stars are asteroids. And as you can see, uh, it, there's not like a super clean division, but they do take up different places of this plot, uh, which indicates by looking at the color and the spectral type of these objects, we're able to distinguish between these different populations. So we uh, wanted to constrain the spectral slope and color of 2013 BZ70 to see where it fit in to these different spectral populations. So this was kind of hard to do because what we got out of the observations is this plot on the left here. Uh, this is the, the spectroscopic observations. Um, looking at this plot along the x-axis, we're looking at wavelength. Uh, here it's measuring pixels and wavelength. Um, Along the y-axis, lots of spatial axis. So this main streak here, that's the source that we're looking at and the spectrum that we wanted to extract. But we have this contaminated source up to the top right, which is causing a big problem here because it is actually affecting the brightness that we're seeing here. Uh, in this plot, the white lines show the aperture where we're extracting the source. Um, and there is some contamination there. But by bending it down a lot, we're able to get a spectrum that looks like what we see on the right here. Um, where we're actually able to constrain the slope. And the brightness from the ferrometric observations is shown as well here, which is consistent with the spectra that we were able to extract. So that's good. Um, just one note about looking at the spectrum, this is showing relative reflectance. Unlike other astro astro astronomy observations you might be familiar with, uh, the light coming from this object is actually scattered sunlight that's being reflected off of the surface. So we're not looking at like light that's emitting. Um, it's, and what this is showing is what fraction of sunlight we expect to be reflected um, at different wavelengths. So that's why we're, we're getting at the surface properties. Um, yeah, just looking at the spectrum, it's red, which means that the object is more reflective at longer wavelengths. And it's also featureless. We're not able to come up with any absorption or emission features by looking at the spectrum which is partly because of how noisy it is. It's obviously possible that there are features below the noise. So by plotting uh, the slopes that we got from the previous spectrum, we're able to compare it to other objects in the solar system. So on this plot, the x-axis is the spectral slope in the optical. 
uh, and the y-axis is the spectral slope in the near infrared. Uh, so those were measured from the optical slope was measured from here, and the near infrared spectral slope was measured from here. So as you can see, the spectrum is flat, those slopes are the same, uh, which is not necessarily true for all solar system objects. So there's a bunch of different populations that you can see on this plot here, and all of the different distinctions aren't super important, but what is important is that 2013BZ70 fits in well with a population of TNOs, uh, which confirms the outer solar system origin hypothesis uh, that we were talking about earlier. In particular, the uh, bright IR TNOs represent um, a scattered population of the Kuiper belt, um, which makes sense. It's consistent with TNOs that are more likely to be scattered inward through the solar system um, and become centers. So this is a completely logical feeder population for the co-orbitals. Uh, we're also able to distinguish it from the asteroids, which are down here uh, in the bluer part of this diagram. So now I'm going to get into that second question, which is when did this object arrive upon its current orbit, or when did it arrive to this part of the solar system? The first way we can get this is by looking back at those dynamical simulations. So this plot, uh, which is from a previous paper on the object, shows the evolution of several clones. So these are like different sets of orbital parameters that are consistent with the astrometric observations of the object. So in any of these clones could represent the orbit. Uh, we're not able to distinguish between them from the astrometry that's been measured. And each line ends when that clone becomes unstable. So their uh, simulated position is shown as you can see, they all become unstable and leave the resonance in between 6 and 26 kiloyears. So this indicates that the object has not been on its current orbit for longer than that, uh, and this is obviously a recent arrival compared to the age of the solar system or the migration of the massive planets or other things like that. This is a recent uh, development. So the other way we can get at answering this question is by looking at activity on the surface. So activity has been observed in around 20% of centaurs that are at this distance. So although that's a minority, it is um, a substantial fraction, which indicates that activity is possible at this distance. However, unlike comets, this activity is not driven by the sublimation of water ice because it's, it's too cold for water ice to sublimate at this distance. Instead, the most likely explanation is the uh, crystallization of amorphous water ice uh, into a crystal lattice which can then um, like heat the, produce more energy that heats the surrounding material and causes volatiles to sublimate where they might not otherwise be able to. So some modeling has shown that this activity can only be caused by uh, some, some disrupting factor, either rapid recent orbital evolution or perhaps some surface activity. So um, this means that we can date uh, when objects might have arrived in the region of the solar system they live in by determining whether or not there's activity. Uh, this plot is uh, really complicated, and I don't understand most of it, but <laughs> basically what we're looking at is the way the crystallization front penetrates over time, and the, the main takeaway is that it halts really quickly. So these objects are kilometers in size. The object that I'm looking at is eight kilometers wide. So a few meters of penetration is very close to the surface. Uh, and it can only continue to crystallize for a very short amount of time before um, the, the, that kind of activity stops. So we're able to get a pr pretty precise date if we're able to observe activity. However, 2013VZ70 is completely inactive uh, to, from what we can observe. Um, here we're looking at the ferrometric observations. Uh, the left shows the stacked image of the nucleus, uh, and then we were able to subtract off the nucleus to get the image on the right. So if there was any activity, we would see a coma there. Clearly there is no coma. Uh, it's completely consistent with the noise. Um, and we, we would be able, our, our, we're pretty sensitive uh, in this realm, so we can get a pretty tight limit on any dust that's there. Um, which means that 2013 BZ70 
is inactive and has been on its orbit or in this part of the solar system for at least 10 to the fourth or 10 to the five years. However, uh, there are some caveats to this. I've, I've painted a pretty simple explanation of what's going on with the active centers, and we actually don't understand what causes um, activity on centers that well. Uh, some people think that because such a small fraction is active, it might require an additional trigger for centers to become active. Um, and if that's the case, that would loosen this constraint. There also have been no direct observations of amorphous water ice. So it's possible that that's not what's causing um, the activity to occur, but is the best explanation available. So in summary, 2013 BZ70 originated as a TNO in the outer solar system before scattering inwards through the center of population, eventually getting captured onto this temporary orbit with Saturn. It has likely been on its current orbit or within the center region of the solar system for at least 10 to the fourth to 10 to the five years. Um, and projecting into the future, it will not be on this orbit for more than 26 kilojoules or so. Uh, thank you. I'm ready for any questions. All right. Thanks for a great talk. We have time for some questions. Sorry, so what could knock, um, great talk by the way, but what could knock an object like this out of its orbit, or is it just passing through? Yeah, that's a great question. So the reason um, the carbal phase space for Saturn or the giant planets is unstable is because of perturbations from the other planets. So in theory, um, if you have like a two-body system with your star and a planet, and then you put a comet in there orbiting or a, another body in there orbiting, it will be stable forever. Um, but if you have other objects, for example, other massive planets in your system, um, it won't be able to stay there. So Saturn actually has no room for long-term stable co-orbitals. Uh, any objects that are orbiting with it will eventually uh, get knocked off their path. Yeah. I think you can comment briefly on the size of the object. Yeah. Is there any evidence for um, shape and elongation? Is it very close to the Earth? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So from the parametric observations, we're not able to say anything about the shape because it's not resolved. However, um, because there is some variation over time, uh, this indicates that it's not round. It's probably very not round. It seems to uh, have a lot of variation in the brightness. Um, also, generally, like I said before, it's eight kilometers in size, so we don't expect objects this size to be round. Um, they're just not big enough to pull themselves into a round shape. Um, <clears throat> in that image that you showed us of the, uh, like the dispersion axis, and there was some kind of contamination in that, what could that be? What could the contamination be? Yeah, I mean, it's probably a star um, or something else like a star. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's just another astronomical object. Um, yeah, I don't know. We, Rosemary and I talked a little bit about um, like, like why they observed when it was there. Um, and because the acquisition images are taken in, um, in the optical, it probably just didn't, it, it didn't seem as bright in the optical um, when they took the acquisition observations. Um, so, yeah. I see like a wide field image of different sources in the field so that you can see if like the dispersed source was like, was actually contaminating like the dispersion of the TNO. Could you not see like a wide field that? It's usually like a, a like, sometimes a disperser will disperse like, many of the, of, well, all the sources in, in the field that you'll see. So if you see a wide field of sources with, with like the small object on it, then you can kind of see um, if the, the dispersion of the sources would like overlap. Like were you able to see a larger field than just this like small portion that you would expect? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're able to see the whole chip. Um, the, the reason why I'm pretty certain that it is contaminated is because if you, if you average along the dispersion axis and plot like the spatial profile, um, the spatial profiles of the two objects do overlap. Um, I, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't do any fitting of the contaminating source um, just because, you know, it's like pretty clearly non-Gaussian um, and like we won't be able to subtract it off anyways. 
but I would anticipate that it's having at least like a 10% effect like at, at this edge by looking at the spatial profile. All right, well, unfortunately we need to move on. Um, so let's thank Anna again. Uh, next we'll hear from Seth Barner. Uh, by coincidence, from the same institution, and that really is a coincidence. It was not for them. Not are <laughs> <laughs> not ganging up on the CFA or anything. Yeah. Well, you have plans. Okay. I don't know why I didn't buy it. There you go. Right. So, uh, hi everyone. Like Matt has said, I am Seth Larner. I'm also from Wesleyan University, where I am a rising senior. And this summer, I've been working with Roseanne De Stefano on a project investigating short-term variability in extragalactic X-ray sources. So first, I want to start with a little bit of background on X-ray binaries because they are primarily what we see when we look to extragalactic X-ray sources in the nearby universe. So. X-ray binaries are uh, compact object star binary systems, where the compact object, either a white dwarf neutron star or stellar mass black hole, is accreting material from its stellar companion. This material infalls onto the compact object, where it heats up and radiates away its energy in the form of X-rays. There are broadly two types, uh, low mass and high mass X-ray binaries defined by the mass of the companion star. The other thing you need to know about X-ray binaries is that they are highly variable, both on short and long-term scales. So on the left here, this is the evolutionary sequence for um, black hole X-ray binaries. And over a period of months, they go in a uh, cyclical fashion from the bottom right of this plot, which is uh, low luminosity, high energy, or hard X-rays, to the top left, high luminosity, low energy, or soft X-rays, and back again. But then we also have short-term variability. On the right, this is the light curve of the famous X-ray binary uh, Cygnus X1. The top is a slice of around two minutes, the bottom four seconds, and we see a lot of variability in both plots. And it's this short-term variability that we're going to be focusing on. So now I'm going to run through five different types of variability that we expected to see in this project, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what we're looking for. So the first type is neutron star flares. So these flares, uh, type 1 and type 2 bursts they're known as, are caused by changes in accretion onto neutron stars. So in type 1 bursts, the uh, accreting material gets hot enough that it undergoes thermonuclear burning. And in type 2 bursts, there is no thermonuclear burning, but a rapid increase in flux is still observed just because of accretion activity. Both of these types of bursts show this distinctive profile and reach uh, peak luminosities of 10 to the 38 or 10 to the 39 ergs per second. Then we also have accretion-related dips. So this is the opposite of flare. The uh, flux is short-term going down, and it, but it is also caused by accretion activity. So the top panel here is uh, a light curve of a uh, X-ray binary in M51. Uh, it's easiest to look at the black line, the blue and yellow are other uh, X-ray energies, but you can just focus on the black line for my uh, purposes here. So we see this dip here in the middle, and uh, the two things I want you to take away from this is that it is highly asymmetric, so it's uh, the ingress and egress to the dip are not at all the same, and that is also highly energy dependent. So here in this bottom plot, this is X-ray color, so we see that before the dip and then into in the dip, the energy changes significantly. So accretion-related dips, highly asymmetric and energy dependent. The next type of variability are stellar eclipses. So this is when the stellar companion in an X-ray binary passes in front of the X-ray emitting region along the line of sight. And on the right here, we have a light curve from one such event. Um, in red is the soft low energy x-rays, and in blue are the hard high energy ones. And we see that when the eclipse starts, there is a near total block of all x-ray photons, and that it is the same in both the blue and the red, the hard and the soft. So there's no energy dependence in stellar eclipses. 
And this is because the uh, stars uniformly block the X-rays from the source. The fourth type of variability are planetary transits. So this is exciting a uh, new field of research. This is on the right M51 ULS 1b, the first planet candidate in an external galaxy. It was detected by a transit across its X-ray binary. So this here is the transit event here at 150 kiloseconds. We notice that it is very symmetric and uh, very deep. The flux decreases to around zero. And this is expected because the size of the X-ray emitting region uh, is small compared to the size of the planet. So unlike in uh, optical transits around main sequence stars, we see a near total blockage of the X-ray emission. Then here I switch to the energetics of this uh, event. So in all three of these plots, this sort of gray shaded area is the event. The top plot is the light curve that you were looking at before. This middle plot is showing the average X-ray energy in collectron volts. And then this bottom plot is showing the hardness ratio. The hardness ratio is a uh, measure of X-ray energy used very commonly. It's the uh, difference in the hard and soft counts over their sum. So it runs from minus one all the way soft to plus one all the way hard. And you see in both of these bottom two plots, again, no uh, energy variability over the course of the event. And similar to stellar eclipses, that's because the planet blocks all X-rays indiscriminately. The last type of variability I'm gonna talk about is binary self-lensing. So this is a phenomenon that can occur in binary compact object systems. So if their orbit, if the plane of their orbit is uh, close to edge on, when one black hole passes in front of the other, if, it's a, if the one behind is accreting, its light will be lensed by the foreground black hole. We see in this uh, artist's rendition, the primary and secondary image, we're not actually resolving those in our cases. So we only observe an increase in flux. So that's what we're seeing here on the right. This is a light curve of a, a candidate self-lensing source. It's a uh, supermassive black hole binary called Spikey. Uh, this, <laughs> this light curve is over a period of uh, 30 days, uh, but we expect to see variability on much shorter time scales. This is such a long time scale because these are supermassive black holes with uh, separation on the order of parsecs. And so the, the orbital period is just a lot greater than the systems we're going to be looking at. So in order to find these uh, variability, we uh, have begun a survey of all Chandra observed galaxies within 11 megaparsecs. So this here in uh, equatorial coordinates is showing the uh, sky coverage of that survey. So each point is a galaxy within 11 megaparsecs taken from a, a catalog. There are 869 of them. Then the blue and red and uh, orange dots are the ones that have been observed by Chandra. The blue dots are in our sample, but have not yet been analyzed and so aren't presented in this work. The orange dots are what we're going to be focusing on. So the blue and orange dots together, there are 289, and then 103 have been analyzed and are being presented on here. So all those galaxies made uh, a, lot, a lot of data, and it's far too much for me to just look at every light curve and pick out what I think is interesting. So I developed a method of automated anomaly detection. So it works by detecting statistically significant changes in the light curve of each source. So how it works is that the light curve, shown here is an example, is broken up into chunks. And these chunks are defined by their edges, where the light curve passes through the line of its own mean. So that's what this red dotted line is here. Then in sequence, each chunk is compared to the rest of the light curve using a statistical test known as an e-test, which uh, compares uh, rates in the Poisson regime. If the rates are statistically different at a rate of, uh, at a significance level of five sigma, they are selected for analysis. And we see in this one, only this red highlighted chunk here is significant. All the others have uh, too high a probability value. So now I'm gonna run you through three interesting uh, flaring sources that we saw and talk to you about their physical implications and what might be going on with the systems themselves. So this first one is a possible flaring foreground star. 
So this source, this X-ray source was identified as being coincident with M82, but it actually has a Gaia parallax, which indicates a distance of only 305 parsecs away. So Gaia has been really good for this kind of work, allowing us to distinguish between what's truly in external galaxies and what's actually in the foreground of ours. So this flare here shown as a light curve is um, characterized by a high degree of asymmetry. This rise to 120 photons per bin uh, happens in just minutes, and then the exponential decay happens over a period of hours. The peak uh, flux compared to the baseline is 46 times higher, and at its peak has a luminosity of around 5 times 10 to the 30 ergs per second. And this luminosity and shape are characteristic of flares in young stars such as MDORs. And these flares have implications for the search of life around exoplanets around these stars because the uh, habitable zone is so much closer. X-ray flares such as this could um, hamper the development of life early on in the star's lifetime. The next source I want to show you is a self-lensing candidate in the SMC. So this is identified as a self-lensing candidate because of this uh, prominent flare here in the middle that is almost completely symmetrical. Um, there is also no significant energy dependence for this flare. So in green here, the green line is the hardness ratio, as I was describing before, and then the light green shading is 90% confidence bounds. So we see during this flare, we see no uh, significant energy change, and it has a uh, flare to baseline flux ratio of around 8. For this system to know if it's truly lensing, we're going to have to model its uh, parameters and see if there is a reasonable binary system that is consistent with this light curve. And we are also going to do a thorough search for uh, other observations of this source to see if there may be some periodic flaring behavior. The last source I want to show off is a possible X-ray burst in M36, M, uh, sorry, M66. So this shows two distinct groups, one here and one here of two flares each. Uh, each flare has a uh, flux to baseline ratio of around 23. At its peak, this source reaches a luminosity of around 1 times 10 to the 39 ergs per second. And what's really notable about this source is the high degree of energy dependence. So again, in green, with the light green confidence intervals, I'm plotting the hardness ratio. And we see during each of these flares, they're basically traced out exactly by hardening events. So whatever is going on during this event, uh, the energy of X-rays released is increasing in time with the flux increasing. Uh, finally, I want to talk about some population statistics. So these are all very preliminary because we have not finished our survey, but I thought I would share what I have so far. So we found 47 statistically significant flares, eight of which are symmetric. We have also found dips, but uh, we are going to wait to present on those at a later date after we can look into them more closely. Then for the average galaxy, accounting for differences in total Chandra observation time and also uh, count rate from the galaxy, we expect to see one flare per 120 kiloseconds and one dip per 3.4 megaseconds. We also find no correlation between star formation rate and the occurrence rate of flares. So that's what this plot here on the right is showing. On the y-axis, I am plotting the star formation rate in units of uh, solar masses per year. And then on the x-axis, in blue, I'm counting the, I'm plotting the counts needed to observe a flare, and in orange, the seconds of observation needed to observe a flare. So we see a lot of scatter in this plot, and as of yet, with our incomplete uh, analysis, we see no correlation. Interestingly, we do find that flares um, occur at a significantly higher rate in irregular and spiral galaxies compared to elliptical and lenticular galaxies. So just to uh, give a summary of my work, we've begun a survey of short-term X-ray variability of X-ray sources within 11 megaparsecs. Uh, even at this preliminary phase, we're already discovering some interesting flaring behavior like lensing candidates, flares in young stars, and X-ray burst candidates. And then we're doing this because this flaring activity can help us constrain the X-ray binary parameters. So, for example, those X-ray bursts, they only happen in neutron star 
systems, and that's something we wouldn't know otherwise. But we do need further work to model and understand all these systems. And lastly, our preliminary population result is that uh, we found flares more in spiral and irregular galaxies. Thank you. I'll take your questions. We have some time for questions. I have a question. Thank you for a very nice Thank talk and research. It's very relevant in the topics. Uh, quick question to nice. So your, your method to, uh, to look at variability uh, looks at the light curves, right? And yes. And you do some tests based on how significant you think those variations are. Uh, but I guess that depends on the specific pinning that you choose to uh, construct this light, light curve. So how, how robust is your method against different binnings? Yes, so it, it is uh, definitely dependent on different binnings. So uh, in the full uh, sample, we are going to be running on a variety of different binning size in order to detect features of different uh, sizes. Because, I mean, the uh, basically in this method, the smallest feature you can detect is whatever size your light curve has been to. So that's definitely a factor. If you like the candidate, is that because uh, the is significant in different binnings as well? Uh, so you require to be significant regardless of the binning in order to plug it as a candidate? Uh, not as of now, but I think that is something we will explore. Second question, sorry if I... No, we have time. Uh, what's your interpretation of the lack of correlation with star formation yeah, I really don't know. Um, we, when we first saw that the irregular and spirals were more common, we, we naturally jumped to, to star formation, right? But then seeing no correlation, um, my best guess right now is just because our, our sample is too small. We need to complete, and then either we will not find a significant difference in spiral and irregulars, or we will find a significant difference in spiral. Uh, correlation with star formation rate. Thank you. Charles? So you, you, you commented on, on the relative pre prevalence of these births in spirals and uh, irregular galaxies. Do you have any candidates in the topology? Um I believe we have one, I believe. It's not ellipticals are the, the lowest uh, category. Um, I have a comment. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Raphael. No, no, no. Oh, well, just to follow up on this thread a tiny bit, um, since you have the spatial information, you could actually, I think, fairly easily locate within the spirals and irregulars each one of your mm -hmm. variables. And it would be interesting to find out, and I bet you will, whether um, the flares locate within bulges, because I bet you'll find that they will locate in the disks and not the bulges, because they'll be associated with um, K and M type stars, and uh, that would be interesting. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something we're looking at. This source, in fact, I have a note, is in a uh, ionized hydrogen region, so that's something we're looking at and uh, for all the significant detections we make. So sorry, Raphael, I jumped on your question. No, I was not going to ask Oh, you? Oh, okay. I already asked two, if you want to ask more. Well, I did actually have one other question. Sounds good. Um, I was wondering why you chose the mean for your e-test as opposed to the median, mm -hmm. since you're looking at variations with time. Yeah, we, uh, we tested both and uh -huh. just found that the mean was giving uh, better results. OK. Um, so I'll try to think about why. Okay. So the mean, just coming back to that, you're you're doing that over the entire observation, or or is it like a moving average sort of? Situation? It's over the entire observation. Um, but actually, this slide is a simplification. So um, so we do it over the whole observation, and then we, if there are any significant chunks, uh, I remove that chunk and run the algorithm again. So if there was a very prominent flare that was. Uh, for example, skewing the mean up, uh, that would otherwise uh, cause us to miss other features. On the second pass, that very prominent flare will be removed, and the mean is recalculated, and the bins are recreated, and the process is rerun. Okay. 
All right, well, let's thank Seth again. All right, and next we're going to hear from Sarai Rankin from Morgan State. Experiencing temporary technical difficulties. Can you guys hear me? Great. Um, my name is Sarai Rankin. I am a rising senior at Morgan State University studying physics. And so these last 10 weeks, I have been working with um, my advisor, Charles Law, and Dr. Sean Andrew Andrews on our SMA continuum survey of protoplanetary disks in the Ceph OV3V star forming region. And so a protoplanetary disk is the cloud of dust and gas that circles a newly formed star. Um, our focus here is on the solid matter, also known as the dust, that coalesces around the disk and eventually becomes the rocky terrestrial planets and or the cores of gas giants. And so studying protoplanetary disks and their evolution helps us understand um, planet formation beginnings and fundamentals. And so the total amount of dust that is within a, within a disk is linked to the number and types of planets that can form. So a proto, uh, the way that we detect disks is by studying their infrared access because um, a, excuse me, a, the dust inside a disk is the submillimeter sized dust. Um, excuse me, I'm really sorry. Um, the millimeter sized dust absorbs starlight from its host star and reflects it back out or emits it back out into space as thermal energy. We can see this thermal energy as um, infrared excess. So in the process of stellar disk evolution, a brand new stellar object will have a envelope of gas and dust and just debris surrounding it. But as the star evolves, the um, gas excess is blown away by jets, and the following disk will have a much less impactful slope, but still a visible one in the black body curve. So the disks that we're studying in this specific research is um, are going to be class two disks, which are the second image, or the second bar on the image on the right. And then after protoplanetary disks have formed and evolved, they will eventually become debris and planets and solar systems as we know it now. So this research targets class two disks, and I have already said the rest of the things in the slide, but a more massive disk will have a higher thermal glow, and that makes it easier for us to detect them. And so the way that we observe these protoplanetary disks is via the submillimeter array located here on Earth in Hawaii. It's an eight-dish interferometer that studies specifically um, dust in the millimeter and submillimeter wavelength range. And so this research has been focused on 1.3 millimeter or 230 gigahertz continuum observations done in the second half of 2021. And so our sources observed have a little bit of complications with them in that our latter sources taken have, a, have had a shorter observation track done and there were some other complications 
during observations, so not everything is completely there. But you'll be able to see that in the data moving forward. And so our sources were chosen due to their infrared access surrounding them, implying a disk. And the types of stars that are observed in this survey are from all sorts of spectral types. And so our focus is going to be on the high mass stars, but due to the sheer number of how often low mass stars like K and M stars occur, there are, there's a very wide sample of them. But our focus is going to be over here on the B to G stars, and those are stars that are the size of our sun or more massive. And so now we can actually get into my data. So the Ceph OB3V star forming region is in the northern constellation Cepheus, and it's one of the largest star forming regions within one kiloparsec of Earth. It's, it rivals the Orion Nebula cluster in terms of size and variety of stars within it. It is, a, it's not a little bit, it's a lot further than the Orion Nebula cluster, but what makes OB3B so special is that it is clear of excessive native ga na natal gas, and so it's a little, a little bit easier to observe the stars found in the region than it would be to observe the ONC, which is still surrounded by an envelope of gas. And so it's got a high density of young stars larger than K4, which is exactly what we're looking to study here. So the big question we're looking to answer is how does dust mass depend on higher stellar masses? And so preceding research in this field has, has most of its focus on the disk masses of low mass stars. So everything, the sun size and smaller. Um, and the trend, found in, the trend found in previous research states that as star mass increases, the surrounding matter disk also increases, which is pretty obvious, not pretty obvious, it's pretty well inferred, larger stars should have more matter surrounding them. But because, um, because previous research has only really focused on matter up to 1.5 solar masses, we just have not sufficiently studied how star disks may vary on higher mass stars. This is a little bit more focused on some similar regions, just so that um, the previous image these are trends in the previous image with a little bit more focus on them. So you can see as the star mass increases in both chameleon and lupus, the slope or the slope between stellar mass and disk mass also increases. However, you can see that in chameleon, which is a region that's a little bit older than lupus and also has um, the lupus region has a much steeper positive slope than the chameleon region. This may be due to the chameleon region being older, and so chameleon is also similar to um, Ceph OV3B in terms of age. And so out of our focusing on my work specifically in the Ceph OV3B star forming region, I used the MFIT and MSTATS um, process in CASA to compute the total integrated flux and RMS to define a sigma value. That was a lot of science words all put together. But so a much easier way of reading that would be to look at the following plot. These are all of our sources that were de confirmed detections within our 64 different sources. And so we found our sources by observing them visually, just like looking at their FITS files and seeing which sources had a particularly bright blob in the center and then by calculating the, the integrated flux value and dividing it by the RMS or the intensity of signal within the noise background, we can determine a sigma value dictating, what, dictating how much of the center bright blob signal is more intense than the background. And so values with a sigma of three or greater would be considered clear, strong detections. And so out of our 64 measured sources, we found nine clear detections and three tentative detections, which could be considered detections, but they're just, they didn't have a signal in the center strong, strong enough compared to the background. And so using this, using the flux densities calculated, I found the disk masses of all of my sources using this equation. And so it's a lot of variables but um, with an assumed temperature of 20 Kelvin and by assuming that all of our disks are optically thin, 
we can use the formula below to determine disk mass and just that the flux density or three times the background signal um, divided by um, an assumed temperature of 20 Kelvin and an optically thin disk. God, a lot of people, excuse me. Um, the relationship between dust mass and flux density is generally linear, and this is to be expected. A bigger disk should be brighter and thus easier for us to observe. Now that we have the stellar or the dust masses, we can observe the relationship between dust and stellar mass and test the following hypotheses that I came up through throughout the summer off of just reading and trial and error. And so my first thought would be that the um, relationship between stellar mass and disk mass would follow the same trend as those found in low mass star forming regions almost to a T. And then after running a few running a few tests and seeing the relationship between flux density and stellar mass, there didn't seem to be a correlation, so I thought it might follow the trend, but with a different slope than lower mass stars, and that didn't turn out completely as I expected either. So there was a third conclusion that it might show no correlation between stellar and disk masses. However, I came up with an eventual plot out of our determined detections and our and our given stellar masses from the original Ceph Ceph Cepheus survey, not just the OB3B region. But so despite looking generally very scattered, there is evidence of a small trend or a small correlation between stellar mass and disk masses. But it's due to the number of non-detections, and that's all of these yellow triangles, there are a lot of unmeasured star or er, and a lot of unmeasured star masses, which explains why there are not 64 points on this graph. It's a little difficult to fit a proper slope to stellar mass to disk mass in the, Ceph in the Cepheus region. However, the inferred trope has a, or the inferred trend has a noticeably flatter slope than the trend found in other star forming regions. And so to compare low mass star forming regions and the Ceph region, I've put up, I believe this is lupus. No, this is chameleon. So chameleon versus the Ceph region, you can see that they are both on a positive scale. A larger disk mass, a larger stellar mass would lead to a larger disk mass. But so in lupus, it's fairly steep. It almost, it's almost a value of two as a slope. Like, but then in the Ceph region, you can see that this orange line dictates the Ceph slope compared to both Taurus and Chameleon in the purple line, showing that um, the slope is almost half as steep. That's not the right word. I'm sorry. But so the slope between these three different regions are almost completely different. And this may have a few reasons. So the trend might be flattening in comparison to other regions due to photo evaporation, where the massive star vaporizes the matter that's closest to it, or stellar winds, so as the star grows older and finishes um, ejecting out surrounding matter, it has blown away all of the matter closest to it in the disks. However, um, planets may have already formed within older regions like Lupus and Cepho B3b, and um, one of the later presenters is also going to be talking about planetary formations. So um, large solids don't emit thermal radiation for us to detect, and so we might not be able to see the planets that have already formed, but we can see that their presence lowers the amount of matter observed in a disk. And finally, a combination of the above reasons might be why Ceph OB3b has such a different disk mass to star mass relationship than other regions. And so some future work to be done would be to clarify all the non-detections that we got by just reabsorbing our sources with a higher sensitivity or under better conditions, or using a different telescope such as NOEMA to also reabsorb at a higher sensitivity and really cement our trend line and see if the new detection influence might change the slope of our line. So in conclusion, out of our 64 sources, we detected 11 disks in one binary system. We calculated the mass of all of these disks, and in total, 
generally, on average, the proto uh, regular protoplanetary disk within the Cephalopy 3b star forming region should form about 54 Earths. But a high fraction of non detections makes it fairly difficult to determine the relationship between stellar and dust mass, and we would need to reobserve all of our sources to fully commit our fully commit to our correlation. And um, I'd like to thank my advisor Charles sitting in the back and Matt and Jonathan for just really helping with this presentation and making sure that all of my research is as accurate as it could be. Um, thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. So, so I, I have one. Um, there's one just there's one very conspicuous high side outlier in your correlation plot. Um, yeah. yeah, there it goes. Um, and I'm wondering what's up with that one that has 200 Earth masses of dust up there. So that top value is called ID4 because they are just numbered, and so it's the top left um, source in this map. Uh -huh. And as you can see, its sigma value is um, 10 sigma, but that just means that it's insanely bright, but though that doesn't make it particularly large. It's just a really abnormally bright source that came out of our selection. So there's, so there's no ancillary data that gives a clue why it's so weird. Yeah, sometimes data is just huh. really bright. However, this could mean that a source this bright and um, this that has a disk this large would definitely prompt um, more investigation. So I'd argue that it could be of more priority than the non-detections because we know it's there and we know that it's large. So it would actually be better to study. Okay. Charles. I'm just curious, the stellar masses, how are those determined? The stellar masses were calculated by the person who took the original survey, Dr. Thomas Allen, who has recently retired. Um, but he just sent them in, in like a large file for us to pull the data directly off of. Um, the problem with that is that um, a lot of his data contains stellar masses that are missing. So that's another reason why this plot does not have all of all 64 data points is that um, not all of the stellar masses were provided, but we did acquire them from someone else. Anna? Sorry, I know you already said this, if I missed it, but um, was your sample selected to only look at stars that showed infrared excess? Yes, so all of these sources are disks, like confirmed disks. So is the, is the non-detection like in, in conflict at all with the infrared excess, or at, I don't know, is um, it consistent? So I can, I can actually explain. I, I, I know what you're saying. But um, a non-detection would actually have a lot of noise and a lot of background influence. So you can see in a value like ID 17, that's a clear confirmed detection. And it's a singular blob that's not really surrounded by much of anything. <sighs> Those aren't words. Um, it's a singular blob with very little influence surrounding it. And it's got a fairly high sigma value. But a value like. It's got a pretty low signal on here. Yeah, ID12 has a lot of background information, and it's noisy, and it's messy, and so that's why it's also considered tentative. So a non-detection looks like that, but just so much worse, the entire um, contour map would be blown out completely. Like the, the upper limits you're able to set, those are like consistent with the infrared excess that's observed? Yes, yeah, so if we set different limits, we might actually be able to just um, limit what could be considered a detection. So if we just set like a higher sigma value, say five, that would actually cut out a lot of these other detections just because of we only want the things with very, very bright sigma or signal influence. If that makes sense. Thank you. I think these are the submillimeter images, whereas the the excesses are measured in the mid IR. Or the, or the near IR. Right. And part of the complication um, that Sarai had to contend with is that many of the, many of the SMA tracks were very short. And because they were so short, 
um, or they or it was there was a lot of water in the atmospheric column. Uh, they tended to be noisy like that. So there's a, there actually um, is not much of a correlation between the IR, the strength of the IR, and the submillimeter signal. It was a, kind of a happenstance of the observing right. that, the that she inherited. Infrared spectra was just used to find the disks, and then the submillimeter is used to like actually observe them. Right. All right, well, let's thanks. Oh, Wait, sorry. What, there sorry, was one. What, there was yeah, a hand in the room. Could you benefit, or could this project benefit from like a multi frequency approach? Like, what more could you learn by, say, looking at multiple frequencies at the same time, or, you know, some sort of I think, approach like that? Sorry, no. Um, discs are traditionally observed in submillimeter, just because that's how the dust re emits back at us. Yeah, I mean, multi frequency within the submillimeter uh, range. Is there any reason that you'd want to do an SED, I guess? I could look into that. That sounds like that sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, I'll ask about that. I don't have a question, but I just want to mention that there's a whole bunch of cheering Sarai on comments. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody. Hi. All right. Well let's thank Sarai for a great talk. All right, so next we're going to hear from Maddie Van Weingarten from Boston University. She's actually going to touch on some of the elements that Sarai raised in her talk. So grateful this computer's going to take a All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maddie Van Weingarten. I am a rising junior at Boston University, majoring in physics and astronomy. Uh, this summer, I've had the pleasure of working with Ryan Cloutier and Dave Charbonneau's group uh, to complete this project. So today, I'll be talking more about how to model radius valley emergence mechanisms with multi-transiting systems. So before I get into that, I would like to just give a brief overview of how we know what we know about exoplanets. So the most common way to identify exoplanet candidates is by observing the decrease in stellar brightness as the planet passes in front of its host star. And this is what is known as the transit method. So over 3,800 planets have been discovered using this exact method through Kepler, TESS, and other transit uh, method surveys. And these discoveries have really revolutionized our modern understanding of exoplanet demographics. And as a result of these discoveries, Astronomers soon noticed that among the population of small, close-in exoplanets, there appeared to be a strange gap in the distribution of planetary radii. So this figure from Fulton et al. 2017 shows the occurrence rate of exoplanets around FGK stars um, for over 2,000 Kepler exoplanets. And as you can see, we end up with two peaks. We've got one peak at about 1.3 Earth radii and a second peak at about 2.5 Earth radii. And this bimodal distribution is what is known as the radius valley. So what are these two populations? So the peak on the left, I'm going to refer to as rocky planets. So these are small planets and they are Earth-like in composition, meaning that they're made up of just rock and iron. Now the peak on the right, I'm going to refer to as enveloped planets. So these have a rocky core, very similar to the peak on the left, but then they're surrounded by these really thick hydrogen-helium envelopes that can actually double the size of the planet in radius. And so now the big question facing exoplanet astronomers is why do we see exoplanets falling into these two very distinct categories? So there's a couple different theories as to what's going on here. Um, I'm going to divide these theories into two categories. The first being atmospheric mass loss mechanisms. So this implies that both planet populations originally formed with these envelopes, but that some planets lost their envelope through atmospheric mass loss. Two possible mechanisms could be photoevaporation or core-powered mass loss. Now the other theory 
is that this bimodal distribution is a direct result of planetary formation, meaning that planets either formed with an envelope or they didn't. And this is known as the primordial radius valley mechanism. And so these are going to be the three mechanisms that I will focus on for the remainder of this talk. And this summer, I was able to create models of each mechanism that, when applied to a large sample of multi-planet systems, may be able to tell us more about which of these models is consistent with different um, system architectures and stellar properties. So I'll now go over each mechanism in further detail and follow up with a description of the software I created to model each one. So we'll start with photo evaporation. So if we're talking about sun-like stars, for the first 100 million years of the system's life, the host star is going to emit this high-energy X-ray and UV photons. And this high-energy photons will interact with the atmosphere and drive these big hydrodynamic outflows of material that can completely strip a planet of its atmosphere, leaving behind this bare, rocky core, just like what we see to the left of the radius valley. Um, so past models have been shown to reproduce the radius valley under this exact mechanism. And numerically, we can understand what's going on here by taking a look at how mass loss is taking place. So this is the photo evaporation mass loss rate. And the only factor that I really want you to pay attention to here is this factor here. Everything else is a quantity that we know. So this is the X-ray and UV luminosity of the host star. And this factor produces some really important unknowns. So when an observer looks at the current state of a given planetary system, the amount and duration of high energy irradiation, this XUV luminosity, is completely unknown. It's very variable. But without knowing the history of high energy irradiation, it really limits how we constrain photoevaporative models for a given planetary system. Luckily, we can eliminate this unknown by comparing planets within the same system. If you have one rocky planet and one enveloped planet that both experienced the same XUV history, you can take the ratio of their mass loss time scales, and this factor will cancel out. And so this is going to be the key of the models that we created here. So if we have planets that span the radius valley, we are able to draw conclusions by comparing the two planets to each other. So if we assume that the rocky planet once had an envelope and then lost it due to photoevaporation, we can calculate what mass the enveloped planet needs to have in order to have maintained its envelope under the same stellar conditions. The next model that I'd like to talk about is core-powered mass loss. So this mechanism has also been shown to reproduce the radius valley. And I've given a little schematic of it here. So this is another thermally driven atmospheric mass loss mechanism. But in this process, after the planet forms, the core begins cooling. And it releases heat radiatively outward through the atmosphere. And if the heat released by this cooling inner core is greater than the escape rate of molecules at the atmosphere, the outer layers of a planet's envelope can become completely unbound. And so this mechanism can actually carve out the radius valley because only more massive planets on higher surface gravity planets will be able to hold on to their atmospheres. So this results once again in two possible planetary populations, either these stripped cores or these enveloped planets. So we can use, model this mechanism using the same strategy that I described for photoevaporation. If the rocky planet lost its atmosphere under core-powered mass loss, what mass must the enveloped planet have to have be able to retain its envelope? Finally, the third and final model that I would like to talk about is what is known as the primordial radius valley mechanism. So this mechanism is really unique from the previous two in that it is not a function of thermally driven mass loss. Rather, it suggests that the radius valley formed directly as a result of planetary formation meaning planets either formed with an envelope or they didn't. So when planets are forming from the protoplanetary disk, they can accrete large amounts of gaseous material, kind of like what's shown here in this artist's rendition. However, the amount of accreted material is highly dependent on the planet's core mass and the local disk conditions. So planets with smaller core masses won't be able to accrete the large atmospheres that we see in the enveloped planet population. So in order for a planetary system to be consistent with this mechanism, 
the envelope mass fraction of the enveloped planet must be greater than the envelope mass fraction of the rocky planet. And so we're actually able to calculate what this envelope mass is, how much mass the planet can accrete, using the following equation. So the mass able to be accreted is set by the maximally cooled isothermal limit. And so this is the point at which the entire envelope becomes isothermal. So the core is unable to cool any further, and the planet cannot accrete any additional material. And we find this limit by integrating over the space from the planetary core to the outermost bound and multiplying by the volumetric disk gas density. But here again, we run into a problem. We are observing the system millions of years post -disc, disk dispersal. So we have no way to know what this value was. But once again, by comparing the two planet populations with each other, um, knowing that they emerged from the same disk, we can safely ignore this quantity. So now that we have a better understanding of what the three mechanisms I'm studying are, we can talk about how I actually modeled them. So each model is designed to be applied only to multi-planet systems that have planets on either side of the radius valley. So they have one rocky planet, one enveloped planet. And we can then calculate what is the minimum core mass needed by the enveloped planet in order to be consistent with whatever mechanism we're considering. So we can then compare this minimum mass needed uh, to the actual measured mass of the enveloped planet to see whether or not the system is consistent. And so I just want to clarify here, consistent only means that a given model can explain why one planet has an envelope when another planet doesn't. So inconsistent implies that whatever mechanism I'm considering cannot explain why the two planets appear in this way. So I created a few different model structures for each mechanism. And so I'm going to start once again with photo evaporation. So um, to begin, the user just has to input the following stellar and planetary parameters. Next, um, so I've created a flow chart kind of outlining the processes happening in my code. But there's only really a few main takeaways that I want you to get out of this. So we begin with the assumption that the rocky planet once had an envelope, but that it's been lost under the mechanism of photoevaporation. So we want to find out first, what is the longest possible time it could have taken for the envelope to be lost? And that is going to be denoted as that max T loss right there. So we find that by looping through a bunch of different envelope parameters until we find the specific parameters that give us the longest possible mass loss time scale. So we know that the mass loss time scale for the enveloped planet must be greater than the mass loss time scale for the rocky planet. Otherwise, the enveloped planet would have also had to have lost its atmosphere. So if we want to find the minimum possible core mass that the enveloped planet must have, we can set the mass loss time scale for the enveloped planet equal to the mass loss time scale for the rocky planet. And we can find the mass that actually equates these two time scales. And it's going to be that value that gives us the minimum that the enveloped planet must have. So to find this core mass value, we use a bounded root solver. So first, we just want to find the maximum and the minimum core mass values that we want to search between. Uh, and then we want to make sure that whatever masses we choose as our limits actually produce physical results. So we check to make sure that the maximum core mass produces a mass loss time scale that is greater for the enveloped planet than for the rocky planet. That makes sense. Uh, if that condition is not met, then the enveloped planet would have had to lose its atmosphere, so there's no solution for that set of planetary parameters. However, if that condition is met, then we can move on and we can use our min core mass and our max core mass as these mass limits, and then search all the mass values in between those two limits to find the core mass that equates the two time scales, and that's going to be our minimum core mass for the enveloped planet to be consistent with photoevaporation. And so the only difference that we're actually going to make for core-powered mass loss, because these mechanisms are rather similar, they're both, you know, these thermally driven atmospheric mass loss mechanisms, we just need to change the relevant mass loss time scale equations. Um, the third mechanism, though, gas pore, or the primordial radius valley mechanism, is going to operate a little bit differently. So as we talked about earlier, the amount of mass that is able to be accreted by a planet is set by the isothermal limit. 
so which is found by integrating over the space from the core to the outermost bound. So first we calculate what this outermost bound is, where accretion is occurring, and we find the maximum amount of material able to be accreted. So we divide that mass by the core mass to find our envelope mass fraction. Then once again, we use a bounded root solver to find what core mass equates the envelope mass fractions of the rocky and the enveloped planet in order to find the minimum core mass for the enveloped planet under this mechanism. So for the last 10 weeks, I was actually able to create the software to test these different models on different, plan diff on different multi-planet systems. So to give, um, to demonstrate what implementation of the software looks like, I recorded an example Jupyter notebook that shows what testing these models looks like from the user's point of view. And so although I've detailed some pretty complicated models here in the past few minutes, uh, implementation is actually very simple and very user-friendly. So here I've just input the planetary and stellar parameters for Kepler-65. So we're just going to have one rocky and one enveloped planet around a sun-like star. And so we, uh, we then take errors into account by taking a Gaussian distribution of width equal to the uncertainty in each parameter. And we then randomly sample from these parameters to generate a distribution of minimum mass values. So in this notebook, I'm only taking 100 samples, just for sake of simplicity. And then I run each model in turn. So photo evaporation, core powered mass loss, primordial radius value. I then save the outputs, and I plot the histograms of the minimum masses returned by each model, as well as a distribution of the measured mass for the planet, for the enveloped planet that we're considering here. Um, and just for further clarity, here's going to be that exact system again, Kepler-65, but here I've taken 3,000 samples rather than just 100. So unfortunately, the uncertainty on the measured mass for this particular planet is rather broad, but we can still see how the measured mass distribution compares to our model outputs. So because we are finding the minimum mass values, we know that the measured mass must be greater in order to be consistent with any given model. And so it is our goal to run many multi-planet systems through these models. Um, and thanks to Kepler, TESS, other transit surveys, we have dozens of systems that we can perform the same level of analysis on that have measured mass values. So to show some preliminary results, I ran my models on 10 different rocky and enveloped planet pairs. So here are those 10 planet pairs. On the left panel, I have the system architecture with the rocky planet shown in black and the enveloped planet shown in gray. And then on the right panel, I have the modes of each minimum mass distribution, as well as the mode of the measured mass for each, uh, for each system that I consider here, as well as one sigma error bars on every value. So there is a lot to digest in this figure, but there's a few key things that I would like to emphasize. So one thing is that you can see we have a variety of system architectures present. We've got some with you know very different mass or yeah very different radii, very different um, orbital periods, and as for the right panel, the most important question that you should be asking when you look at this is: Is the red triangle, the measured mass, to the right of our model outputs? If so, that means the measured mass is greater than our predicted minimum, and so that model is consistent, and it gets marked with a green smiley face. If the measured mass is less than the model outputs, that means it is inconsistent with those models and is marked with an X. And so by evaluating many more exoplanets, we hope to look for trends in what types of systems are consistent with which different mechanisms. Does it vary with stellar type? Does it vary with the orbital separation of the two planets? These are really important questions that could bring us closer to understanding the actual origins of the radius valley. So to recap, the discovery that exoplanets form in these two distinct planet populations has motivated the study of possible mechanisms that could explain this bimodality. So I modeled three such possible mechanisms, photo evaporation, core powered mass loss, and the primordial radius valley mechanism. These models can be applied to multi-planet systems to derive the minimum core mass needed for the enveloped planet in order to be consistent with a given model. And when applied to a large set of different systems, we aim to identify trends in model consistency with different system architectures and different stellar properties. Thank you so much for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions.
very much, Manny. We have time for some questions. Charles? So in the core power of mass uh -huh. where does that energy come from? Is that just the, the energy of formation, or is it radioactive decay going on in the Yes, it's really just a direct result of that planetary formation. So as that core is cooling, it's going to release um, this thermal energy radiatively throughout the atmosphere through radiative diffusion. And in some cases, if the planet doesn't have a very high surface gravity, that can be enough to unbind those outer layers of the atmosphere and drive that um, mass loss. Yeah. So I have the impression that when you arrived, that Ryan had set you the task of explaining one system in particular, which was 36C, which I notice has an unsmiley face <laughs> next to it, yeah. um, if I'm not mistaken, or an X. And so, um, and, uh, yes. Um, and I'm wondering, since, since that one was picked, people I'm assuming must have already thought about that and have some ideas to explain that particular system. Mm -hmm. But you have now have these refined models which appear to not work. So I'm wondering if there is now tension uh, in the explanation for at least <laughs> this one, or what? Do you, what is your opinion? Because your model works for at least the majority of these systems but not the one that you were targeting first. <laughs> right, so um, this isn't a super, I mean, we wanted to test this on a really a big variety of multi-planet systems to try to get a better idea of different types of model consistency. But I will admit, Kepler-36 is a bit of a controversial result that I'm showing here. Uh, so this is a really well-studied system because um, if you look at the system architecture, you can see that the rocky planet and the enveloped planet are really close in orbital period. On this logarithmic scale, scale, they actually are shown overlapping. So they're really close in period. So this system has been really well studied under photo evaporation because it's very curious that they're so close in orbital period, so they're receiving a really similar amount of high energy luminosity from their host star. So why was one planet able to hold on to its atmosphere when the other planet wasn't able to? Um, so there have been like hydrodynamic models of this system. Um, it's been really discussed in, liter in the literature. So there's been hydrodynamic models that show that Kepler-36c is consistent with photoevaporation. And um, there's obviously a little bit of like overlap in the possible mass and the minimum mass distribution that I've calculated. But it is interesting that the model that me and Ryan have made has shown that it's largely inconsistent with that particular mechanism. So it's a result that we're definitely hoping to look further into. Because uh, it's, it was definitely very surprising for us. Okay, fair enough. Oh. All right. Any other questions? Um, for the bottom system on that plot, I noticed there's no measurement. There's no red triangle. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk further about that. So this is um, a test object of interest, which means it's an exoplanet candidate. So it doesn't have a measured mass value. But it's still a really interesting system that uh, we wanted to consider here just to see what kind of results we could get. And so the reason that it's kind of curious is because, one, it's orbiting an M dwarf, not a sun-like star. And then, two, you can see that um, the enveloped planet actually is, has a shorter orbital period than the rocky planet. And so if you're looking at, say, photo evaporation, that would imply that the enveloped planet, since it's receiving a higher flux of those high energy photons, it would have to be a much larger mass in order to have retained its envelope, considering the fact that the rocky planet, at a further orbital period, lost its envelope. And so I actually have a slide about this one. Um, so this is the actual measured mass, the predicted mass distributions for my three models for this particular system. And so you can see that these are pretty high core mass values you know, around like 10 Earth masses. That's fairly massive for an exoplanet. But if you look at an actual um, mass radius distribution for planets around M dwarfs, you can see that, this exam that these results are actually not unphysical. So it would be centered around, you know, 
here or so on this mass radius diagram. And so these, while being larger masses, are actually something that's not fairly surprising. And so our promising results and definitely, I think, imply a, um, a need for further uh, observation on this particular object. Okay. Well, let's thank Maddie for a great talk. We're going to adjourn briefly, and then we'll return for the team that's going to bat clean up on the day. Okay.
Get down. Can you take your seat? Welcome back, everyone. It's amazing how Jonathan has that power. I do not possess it how I wish I did. Um, so we have uh, just two talks remaining on our agenda today. And we will now hear from our penultimate speaker, Mackenzie Ferrari from UMass Dartmouth, who will tell us about detached eclipsing binaries. Hi everyone, my name is Mackenzie Ferrari. I'm a rising senior at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth studying physics. Um, so I had the pleasure uh, this summer to work uh, directly with Nancy Evans and Joanna Karaskovich on a uh, project related to detached eclipsing binaries and their role in developing an improved mass temperature relation of hot stars. All right, so to get into it, I have here written that mass is the strongest driver of a star's evolution. So basically, in other words, depending on a star's initial mass, it may evolve uh, differently. And so this is kind of the underlying motivation behind the research that I'll be talking about today. Um, there are some questions, however, that might arise from a statement like this. Um, how can we actually determine the mass? For maybe any skeptics here, are we actually sure that mass is the strongest driver? What else can mass influence? Um, but just for the sake of this talk, I'm just going to focus on one, uh, one of these questions for now, is that how can we actually determine the mass of a star? And so fortunately for us, there's a very special configuration of stars that actually allow us to determine the masses of the stars within the configuration in a fairly simple way. And so detached eclipsing binaries, or DEBs, um, occur when two stars orbit around each other. Um, and they're detached because they do not significantly influence uh, the other star. Basically, in other words, um, the stars are able to evolve independently of each other. And so what makes the binaries eclipsing is that when we view the system edge on, um, like this video is showing, as one star passes in front of the other, the luminosity of the star in the back um, is dimmed. And so from observing the motion of these stars, we can then figure out some pretty fundamental properties of the system, like the radii of the stars, the orbit's eccentricity, um, its orbital period, and so on. And so one of the properties that we can robustly determine from this uh, configuration is the mass of each of the stars within the binary. So thankfully, we didn't have to do uh, this work ourselves. Uh, Willy Torres in 2010 um, led a very thorough study of the literature um, and checked measurements for uh, 95 DEB systems. And so our research uh, greatly benefits from his work in determining the masses. So um, within about a minute, I've already kind of explained. One second. Oh, it's frozen. Oh, no, it's frozen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not a minute. It might be two minutes. I was worried when the animation froze. Oh, no. Look away, everybody. <laughs> hmm. Well, that was a good one. Well, Maybe a reboot in progress. It's completely frozen. Hmm. It's like the fishing all over again. <laughs> it broke it. Huh.
we're making progress, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want that to be clear. <laughs> How are you feeling right now? <laughs> Everything good? Yeah. <laughs> feeling cool? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the building suspense. <laughs> not oh do all right go for it you can actually go to the next one we won't break it okay yeah just go there <laughs> no that wasn't expected oh, okay all right thank you <laughs> All right, so as I was saying in those previous five minutes, I'd already kind of answered one of that, the, the main question that I had posed is how can we actually determine the mass of a star? Um, so um, this is just one very small subset of uh, an actual configuration of a star. Um, and unfortunately, only a very small fraction of all stars exist in a configuration like this where the mass can easily be determined. So if we want to take this kind of question a step further, um, what can we do about stars where the mass cannot be easily determined? And so this is actually where DEBs play a pretty important role in this. So we can actually take the information we derived from these DEBs, um, specifically their masses and their temperatures, and create a direct mass temperature relation that can then be applied to other stars of similar properties. Um, so you could be thinking, like, this seems like a fairly straightforward uh, thing, like mass and temperature are fairly uh, important properties. How has this not really been done before? Um, so many of the most prominent like uh, temperature um, calibrations um, are based on spectral types, which is from the optical range. Um, and so if you're trying to compare both the mass and the temperature, it's a fairly indirect relationship. So what we're instead proposing is that we can uh, take the mass of a star and directly infer its temperature. Um, so we believe that we've exploited a very unique and fortunate set of circumstances in order to directly link the mass of a star to its temperature. So basically, to quickly summarize, we have robust measurements of the masses of stars within a DEB. We then just need the temperatures of those stars in order to create a mass temperature relation. And so then this will help us determine the masses of stars in which we are not um, able to easily determine the masses. So one of the ways in which we can determine how hot something is is by how much energy passes through a certain area over a certain amount of time. Um, so this diagram shows the flux density for four different um, Temperature, uh, temperatures over the same wavelength range. So the lowest temperature here um, is the one um, at the bottom of 10,000 Kelvin, um, which is still a very hot temperature. Um, and though it does look like it's at zero, there actually is quite a bit of um, flux there. And so as you increase the temperature of these uh, values, the, the flux um, increases by a significant amount. And this makes sense if you were to add energy to a system, you're uh, increasing the temperature, and that means uh, more flux. Uh, but the interesting and fortunate thing for us is that these changes in flux occur in a particular wavelength range um, from about 1,000 to 2,000 angstroms. And so this range right here is towards the shorter end of the ultraviolet or UV wave, uh, wavelength range. So if we want to determine the temperature of a star and be pretty confident about our determination, we should focus on the UV range. Um, so it might not seem like it during the summertime, but the Earth's atmosphere is pretty good at absorbing UV, uh, UV radiation. Um, but because our atmosphere is very good at that, in order to observe objects in the UV, we need to go to space. So this is where the International Ultraviolet Explorer comes into play. So back in around the 80s, the satellite was designed and operated specifically for this use. And so what we've done is we've gathered UV spectra of 24 DEBs, for which we know pretty robust measurements of the mass, thanks to Willie and his team. We um, were also particularly interested in uh, hot stars, which we've kind of defined as um, or the range of 7,000 to uh, 35,000 Kelvin. Um, and this is kind of the typical range for those upper main sequence stars, which is the O, B, and A type stars. Um, I do also want to note that the, UV, uh, the IUE spectra that we've collected describes the entire DEB. So what I mean by that is that the um, spectral energy distribution, which you see here, 
is, the, uh, is a composite of both the primary and the secondary. Um, so the contributions from both are included in this. So if we want to figure out the temperatures of the primary of the hotter, uh, the hotter star, we need to somehow disentangle both uh, contributions. All right, so how can we actually determine the temperatures from our given IUE spectra? So the temperature model that I actually, uh, the four temperature models I showed earlier are actually stellar atmospheric models that were generated by um, Bolin et al. in 2017 called uh, Bosch or Boss Z models. Um, and these were models based on Carew's calculations done for the, uh, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph on Hubble. Um, I like to think of them as like calibrated spectral energy distributions for which we know the temperatures for. So what we can do is we can take our IUE spectra, compare them against these Bosch temperature models, and then figure out the temperature of our IUE spectra. All right, so how did we actually figure out the temperatures of the hottest stars in these DEB systems? What we did is we first um, started the process by assigning the primary and secondary um, components with their own Bosch temperature model based on initial first guess um, provided from Torres et al. Um, in his reference. So here you can see um, the green spectrum right there is the primary, which we've assigned a temperature of about uh, 9,188 Kelvin. And then the secondary, um, we've given a temperature of 9,125 Kelvin. And so then we added the two uh, spectra together to form this red composite spectrum. Um, and that's in red. And then we compared it against the black spectrum, which is the IOE spectra that we have. And again, the IUE spectra itself is a composite of two. And so this is a system in which the temperatures of the primary and secondary are pretty similar. Um, they're within like 60 uh, Kelvin. Um, but you can see that the secondary does contribute a significant amount to the overall um, composite spectrum. And so to disentangle these two temperatures, what we can then do is keep the secondary temperature uh, fixed and then vary the primary's temperature until we're able to match that red composite spectrum to the IUE spectra. All right, I got worried there for a second. One second. Okay, sorry. Um, so to quickly recap, we took the UV spectra of 24 DEBs and compared them against uh, many of these Bosch temperature models to determine the temperature of the hottest star. Um, but because there are two uh, stars within a DEB that we need to account for, we have to group our 24 systems into four different groups, depending on the estimated temperature difference of those two com uh, components. The four groups are fairly um, straightforward. Um, the first one, the uh, temperatures of both comp uh, components are fairly similar, like the example I just showed that I'll get back to. Um, then the primary, um, the second group, primary is much more uh, greater than the secondary. The third one, the primary, uh, actually has a lower temperature than the secondary. And then the fourth group, we lovingly called the God Only Knows group because it had <laughs> some issues that we'll need to uh, work on in the future. But um, I wanted to go back to that example that I showed. And so here, what I've done is that I've, um, that uh, initial first guess temperature, we took a range. And so what I have here on the left is the lower end of that primary temperature range, which we've assigned the primary temperature of about 9,062 Kelvin. And then the hotter end of the range, we assign the primary a temperature of 9,375. All right, so what the heck are we looking at? Um, I'm going to try and hopefully make it a little bit easier to see. Um, so I'm just going to block out the right side. We're just going to focus on the shorter wavelengths. So if you just focus here on the composite spectrum, uh, which is the spectrum in red, on the left side you can see that the composite is below the IOE spectrum, whereas on the right it's slightly above the IOE spectrum. So if we instead flip to the longer wavelengths, it's the opposite. So here on the left, the, the composite is slightly higher than the IUE, whereas here it's uh, fairly significantly below the IUE spectrum. So if we look again at the overall picture, we believe that based on this kind of seesaw, almost like behavior with the spectra, that the temperature of the primary must fall somewhere between this range of 9,062 Kelvin to 9,375. And if you just think about it, this is a fairly small temperature range, about 300 Kelvin. Um, so this is just one example for the many <laughs> DEVs that we looked at, but I think it illustrates pretty well the general process of how we determine the temperature of the primary star. So just another quick example of a visual uh, way to look at this difference. Um, so this is a sum to difference plot. So each of the spectra here, which are plotted in different colors, uh, represents the difference between the IOE spectrum and the composite spectrum. 
So the closer the spectrum is to a flat line represents um, the likelihood that uh, that is the most accurate temperature of the primary star. And so we start with the cooler primary uh, end of the, the, spect uh, the, the range, and then we go to the hotter range. Um, so again, to kind of help uh, see what the difference is between all of these, I'm just going to block out um, those emission lines. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to try and dry, draw some lines over here to hopefully illustrate that kind of seesaw behavior that we saw previously. So if we just kind of progress down um, up to hotter temperatures, you can kind of see that the different spectrum gets uh, fairly um, flat. And then it kind of dips again um, into the other direction. And so again, this is just another visualization that um, the best primary temperature, we believe, falls within this wavelength range. And so here you can see that we believe that the primary temperature is about 9,188 Kelvin. Great. Um, again, another way to see um, the best temperature is what we did was that we developed a way to calculate the standard deviations of the different spectra and then plotted a parabola to that fit. And so again, um, the lowest standard deviation, which corresponds to the minimum of the parabola, should uh, indicate what the best primary temperature is. And again, you can see here that 9,188 is close to that minimum of the, the parabola. We did have some issues with uh, calculating the errors um, based on this type of method. Um, so uh, up until now, we had just estimated the temperature errors based on the closest models. So in this instance, we had a best temperature of 9,188 Kelvin and then plus or minus 62 Kelvin. Um, but we have been working on a very, uh, a different technique of a chi-square fit that is actually showing a lot of promise to actually uh, provide robust uh, estimated errors or robust errors. So in the end, we were able to find temperatures of the primary star for 21 of the original 24 DEBs that I mentioned. Um, of those 21, there were another two systems, um, which are, uh, so chi-squared, yeah, right there, and then AH-SEP. Um, those were two additional systems where we were able to find temperatures, um, but for various reasons, we're not entirely confident in them, but we did just want to plot them against a relation. And then this relation that we plotted is using only 19 of those DEVs. Um, and so there are some interesting trends here that I'll briefly talk about. Um, so unfortunately, a few of the hottest DEVs fell into that God only knows category. Um, so we weren't able to find temperatures that we were confident in. Um, our relation is also linear rather than curved. Um, we're going to try and explore potentially uh, different ways of representing that. Um, there is also uh, this cluster of stars right here, which are actually metallic stars. And so because of their opacities, um, some of the energy emitted from the stars uh, might actually not be able to reach beyond the star, and so it, the stars appear to be cooler than they might actually be. But again, we are hoping to follow this up with future work. And just to kind of sh uh, link back to what I previously mentioned about uh, other mass temperature relations, um, on the left is a MT relation based on spectral types derived from uh, Cox's Astrophysical Quantities, a very popular textbook. Um, and you can see that our, the relation is above our values. Um, on the right is Harmonic's um, mass temperature relation, which is a very good relation um, that is curved, and it seems to fit our data pretty well. Um, but um, we do have to follow up with, we would like to follow up with potentially more hotter stars. Um, yes. Um, so in the end, we were able to generate precise measurements of DEB temperatures um, of hot stars, and then our um, for the cooler stars, our relation um, tended to estimate actually higher temperatures, not lower. Um, and we are hoping that in future work, we'll be able to uh, follow up with more of those hotter DEB systems, as well as implementing a chi-square technique to better um, solve those uh, the errors. And then we want to then apply our mass temperature relation to potentially Cepheids and their companions. So that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yeah, great talk, Mackenzie. I just wanted to ask, um, while you were doing your work over the past few weeks, how did you account for reddening? Did you run into any problems with that? Or? Um, we did account for reddening. We ran, um, we checked three systems uh, where we varied the reddening value, um, 0.05 to I think 0.25. Um, and we found that it had really no significant, uh, our estimated temperature 
did not change by much at all. Um, so we did we did test that. Yes. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. I guess the satellite's long gone. Yeah, no, that was something we were we were confused by. Um, I, so I have a couple of questions. Um, so you chose 24. Did you choose those because specifically because they were observed by IUE? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I was wondering, you have these high side outliers, mm -hmm. but um, I guess you're maybe hinting at the end that you don't necessarily think they're outliers. Mm -hmm. um, do Are you willing to be pinned down as to your opinion about them? <laughs> um, I'm pretty, I think that the temperatures that we found are pretty good. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if I want to say any more than that, but <laughs> but I don't know. Okay. Just a, an editorial comment on that question. Richard Feynman used to say that when you looked at the uh, plot of data taken by an experiment, was here's of course just a pure you always ignore the, 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 the extreme low and extreme high point. That's where the most likely to screw up. <laughs> I think it's true that in the next couple months there's going to be a mid-ex selection and there are a large number of UV centric proposals for that round. So we might have an abundance of UV spectra that your generation will enjoy. It is about time for an IUE too, isn't it? Okay, well, let's thank McKenzie again. So next we'll next we'll hear from Will Gillay. Yep. Go right ahead and punch the mic up. From the University of Iowa. There we go, okay. All right, so hello everyone, my name is Will Golay. Um, I'm from the University of Iowa, I'm gonna be a senior this year. Um, I'm studying astronomy, physics, and math. Um, and in the past I've worked on stellar radio emission and optical spectroscopic instrumentation in collaboration with Robert Mutel. Um, this summer, I had the pleasure of working in the bicep Cat collaboration uh, where I've been working on characterizing the beams of, of these telescopes and demodulation systematics. Um, so I'm going to start with the cosmic microwave background. So what is the cosmic microwave background? This is a uh, leftover light uh, emitted about 380,000 years after uh, the Big Bang. Uh, this is a remnant that we see in the background in the microwave wavelengths uh, as the universe cools. Uh, in the cosmic microwave background, the variations that we see uh, in the intensity uh, are very small. And also, uh, other observations of the universe have shown that the universe is geometrically very flat. Um, and so these precise uh, cosmological measurements have raised some issues um, with our standard cosmological model uh, uh, and the predictions that we've made. Uh, 
these observations that we see of the modern uh, universe would have required some very precise fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe. And so we have the benefit of the CMB. The CMB allows us to probe those initial conditions. Um, and so to solve these problems, a group of theories have come out uh, generally categorized by the idea of inflation, which is a sh an extremely short period of time in the early universe. Uh, where the universe, ex the size of the universe expanded extremely rapidly. Um, something that would have accompanied inflation is primordial gravitational waves. Uh, these, these gravitational waves would have imprinted a very specific pattern of polarization into the cosmic microwave background. Um, and so because this, we have uh, something great like this to accompany inflation. This is something we can test. However, they're very faint. The, the predictions are, would be that the polarization is very faint. So we need very good observing conditions, which is why we have the bicep tech array down at the South Pole. Uh, this is, th these provide the conditions that we need. It's a cold, stable atmosphere, and we have the benefit of a constant view of the same patch of sky. Uh, the bicep tech array is just is a series of telescopes that's been operating for about the last uh, 15 to 20 years and works in around 30 to 270, 270 gigahertz. Uh, and the data that I'll be focusing on is in the 90 gigahertz band, wave band. So the design of these telescopes uh, consists of the following. Uh, we have a focal plane that has about that has thousands of detectors, um, and they come in pairs. Uh, the reason we want them in pairs is because we're trying to detect a polarization. And so each one of these detectors uh, is orthogonally polarized from one of the other. Uh, if we sum, we get the bolometric power or the intensity. And if we take the difference, uh, we get that polarization measurement that we're interested in. Uh, each detector is coupled to an antenna. And this uh, antenna plus the rest of the optical train that you can see in this figure uh, gives you what we call the beam or the optical transfer function of that detector. Um, the beams of the pairs of the orthogonally polarized detectors aren't necessarily the same. Uh, and this is a very important fact because uh, we want to, um, we're interested in taking, measuring the polarization, so we need to take that difference. And so this means that mismatches are possible in the beams of these two detectors. Uh, in this figure, what you're seeing is in the top, you have, we have a measurement of the A detector beam, so one of the uh, detectors in the pair, and then the B detector beam is in the middle in the middle row, and then we have the difference of the two. And so this mismatch, uh, when we take the difference of the responses of the detectors, makes t a temperature signal of uh, the CMB appear as a polarization signal. So we get this bias um, that we don't want, and we call that temperature to polarization leakage. Uh, we want to measure this difference extremely precisely because this is actually one of the largest systematic contaminants in the uh, CMB polarization measurements. Uh, this is very important uh, for constraining the polarization that we do see in the CMB. Okay, so how do we generate these, uh, these beam maps, uh, as we call them? Uh, here's the setup at the South Pole. Uh, we have bicep and keck array. Uh, we place a, a, a mirror above each of the detector arrays uh, that point at a calibration source uh, on the horizon. Uh, this source alternates between a uh, bright and a dim source, uh, which we would call the chop source. Uh, we are also able to record uh, at any specific time whether the source is on or off. Um, the reason we want to view an alternating source is because we want to be able to differentiate it from the background. So you see that there's a lot of other things uh, nearby that would potentially be in the field of view, and we'll see a, 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 that in a second here. Uh, since we don't know the properties of the background, we want to reject that. We scan across the source in rows, and what we get uh, is a result. What we get as a result, as we scan, is the amplitude of the source times the response of the beam at that time. We call that the modulated signal. So, here's what this might look like. Uh, we're looking at what you can see is an optical image of what you would be if you were standing on the mirror, and then what the telescope sees as we've done scans. So, the bright red patch that you see is the source that we're interested in. Uh, and then everything else is contamination from the background. So our goal, uh, and what I've been working on this summer, is an algorithm that can go from this to the individual modulated scans to something that looks more like this, where we've rejected all of the background and we've isolated the part of the image that has been alternating, uh, and we get our beam map uh, that you saw earlier. So I'm showing a little bit of a preview here of the modulated signal that we see. Uh, this is the, what the raw data actually looks like. So what we get is, uh, these, these are some examples. So we have some real data taken from 2016 through 2018. And then we have uh, a simulated signal that I've created in the bottom, where we have the on and the off of the modulated, of the alternating chop signal source. 
And then we have the data points, which are samples of the beam as we scan across that source. Um, so how do we recover the beam? We have this nice modulated signal. How do we get the measurements uh, out of this? We have demodulation algorithms. And so this is what I've been working on this summer, is developing these algorithms, characterizing the one we have, uh, and um, finding ways to compare uh, these two. So the current method that we use is called squared demod. Uh, what we do is we first divide the entire uh, time stream into reference uh, using the reference signal that, that we recorded earlier into regions of high and low. Uh, in other words, when is the source on and when is the source off? And then what we do is we say, okay, we're going to take the sum of the points in the say the second and third region up here, and then we're going to subtract off. Uh, the sum of the points in regions one and four, and then we repeat that process for the entirety of the scans that we've done. And also, I want to mention here that there are uh, reweighting schemes that are possible. So, well, what you're seeing here is if we did a cosine weighting. So, some of these uh, data points, so the where the, where the chop goes from on to off, would be um, going from the one to two region, and then going from off to on would be the three to four region. So, uh, samples that have been taken near the chop. Uh, we might want to wait less, uh, wait less for various reasons. Um, so why would we want to bother with this? Why would we want to change square demod? Um, so here's that simulated signal again that I mentioned earlier. And we have the perfect Gaussian beam, no noise, uh, just a perfect on-off. And if we apply square demod, we should be able to recover the beam exactly. Uh, we try that. Turns out it doesn't. Um, so this is what the first thing that I did this summer is characterizing the performance of square demod. Uh, so even in the case of a perfect noiseless signal, a uh, perfect noiseless modulated signal, we aren't able to recover the beam exactly. Uh, yeah. So the next thing I did this summer was develop a new algorithm called Scotty. Uh, this is developed uh, essentially on the idea that we want to separate the beam from the modulated signal instead of in a time stream in uh, frequency space. Uh, this has a few major benefits, but I want to highlight one of them, which is allows for simpler noise suppression. So there are a lot of there are a variety of noise sources. Um, it, we could have a, a jitter in the phase uh, where uh, the chop is not exactly lined up. Um, the chop reference is not exactly lined up with the modulated signal, as an example. Um, and so the other benefit is that there are no restrictions on how this separation is done once we are in frequency space. So how do we demodulate in frequency space? Uh, turns out we have something convenient where called the convolution theorem, uh, which is that the point-wise multiplication in the time stream, which is what's happening, uh, we have the, the amplitude of the chop reference times the response of the beam at that time is equivalent to convolution in another. So the main thing I want you to take away from this is there's a lot going on. We have an example of how that actually works, but the main thing I want you, I want you to get out is that we want to do the inverse of this process. Uh, we have the modulated signal. It's in frequent. We take the Fourier transform. We're in frequency space now. We want to do the inverse of this process, which uh, to be able to recover the beam. So the three steps are one: we take the Fourier transform of our modulated signal and the chop reference, and then the second thing we do is we do this inverse process, a deconvolution. Uh, we chose to implement this using clean, which is commonly used in interferometric radio astronomy. And then finally, once we have uh, the result of our deconvolution, we, uh, oh yeah. I should, I should mention, this is where the benefit of noise suppression comes in. Since noise typically is my, uh, manifested in the high frequencies, well, we can ignore those terms and uh, not look for uh, any signal at the high terms, at the high frequency terms. And then finally, once we have the results of our deconvolution, we can take the inverse Fourier transform uh, of, that, of that result to recover the beam. So let's come back to that noiseless signal. Just as a reminder, here was the output of square demod. Uh, we have the residuals in the bottom, which are showing us, okay, we know the analytic solution of the beam, which we use to generate this data. Uh, let's take the difference of what our, out, of our demodulator put out, and we get these differences, and it's a pattern. That's not, a, that's not at all what we want. Um, so let's see how Scotty does. Okay, this is good news. It does a lot better. Uh, so Scotty performs better on the noiseless signal. Um, we have uh, residuals about two orders of magnitude lower, and it's not as patterned except for some ringing on the edges of the time stream which ordinarily we could cut off. Um, so we have two demodulators now. Uh, how do we compare them, especially on real time streams? So the third thing I did this summer was to develop metrics to compare demodulators. So the first metric is a bias signal addition. So what we do is we have, we generate a perfectly, a perfect sine wave, and then we apply the demodulator. When we, if, if we apply a demodulator to a perfect sine wave, we should get no signal at all. 
If there's any deviation from that, uh, that is a bias that's been introduced by the demodulator. The second metric I developed is, called, is a noise rectification uh, metric where we begin by fitting a model for a modulated signal to the initial time stream, and then we fit a model, a Gaussian model for the beam uh, once we've applied the demodulator, and we look at the average residuals and see if they've changed significantly, and if they have not, then that's an indication that the demodulator is accurately representing the noise in the initial time stream. And then the final metric is a noise scaling. Uh, this is best explained by the qualitative evaluation using this metric, which is that if we look at the amplitude of the demodulated signal and we plot that against the residuals, uh, we should see hopefully no dependence um, in, that, in the uh, amplitude of the demodulated signal um, with the residual. So we've so I mentioned earlier that we'd simulated some time streams, so this is the result. I'm only going to point out a few things on these tables. Uh, the main difference between the three tables is the background level. Um, this is something that I identified early on as, a, as, a, as something that can introduce um, errors into the uh, resulting demodulation. And so the top figure, or the top table is a no background. The middle figure is a low background that is constant. And then the bottom table is a uh, higher background that is varying in time. And so what I want to point out is that Scotty, uh, as indicated by the second and third metrics I just discussed, uh, has better noise suppression properties by about an order of magnitude um, below that of square DMOD. However, what's really important in the final data analysis pipeline uh, is, that, is the beam parameters. So that would be the center of the beam and then the width of the beam. In other words, those are the parameters that come out of fitting a Gaussian to the resulting demodulation. Uh, and so, also I want to point out that there are uncertainties here that I'm reporting, which was done by essentially simulating hundreds of different time streams and then taking the averages of the metrics uh, computed um, for each one of those simulated time streams um, where I had injected noise. Um, so, this is the simulated case. How does, how does the two demodulators perform on real time streams? Um, so, the first thing to point out is these are the same time streams that I showed you before. Uh, square DMOD does tend to reject the background better, uh, as we can see here. Scotty tends to do worse on the edges of the time streams, as we saw in the perfect uh, in the perfect signal case. Um, and then, but the, uh, as a qualitative evalua evaluation, Scotty does tend to result in uh, smoother uh, main beams, as you can see in the 2017 and 2018 data. You can see that some of the that this uh, jitter effect is present um, in the output of Square DMOD, but not in Scotty. Um, however, yet again, uh, if we do the least squares Gaussian fit to the resulting beam, and that's going to give us some uncertainty on the beam parameters, we do see that Scotty has a larger beam parameter by about a, a beam parameter uncertainty by about a factor of two. So, what's next for beams and demodulation systematics? Uh, Scotty does show a lot of promise on the noiseless case and shows the benefits of this particular approach, doing it in Fourier space uh, rather than in the, directly in the time stream. Um, however, since the beam parameters are being biased by about an order of magnitude, when we do use Scotty instead of square DMOD, uh, that is still the best option um, for the analysis. And so we have a few different ideas on how to improve Scotty, uh, one of those being uh, improving the background rejection process. And then we also want to continue to work on square DMOD and see if we can improve, now that we have metrics that we can compare different iterations of demodulators, we want to um, work on things like modifying the weighting schemes and the way that the values of the beams are calculated. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much, and I will take your questions now. Okay, we have time for some questions. Well, I have one. Uh, so it, it's, it goes right to this first bullet, actually. Okay. So I'm wondering what what you would entertain um, as a means to improve the background rejection so, um, to improve Scotty. So one of the ideas is that one of the main problems that I've identified with Scotty is that since it is a deconvolution uh, and we're, and all the only data we get from the reference source is whether it's on or off and not the actual amplitude of the reference source, uh, that uh, results in some issues with the way that the background rejection is done. So in the case where we would know the actual amplitude of the reference source rather than whether it was just on or off, uh, it, 
I've shown using simulations that Scotty does actually perform quite a bit better than Square D mod. Um, but since the experimental setup, that is not the case of the experimental setup, that's kind of the next thing to work around is, okay, how can we maybe do some estimations for the amplitude of the back of, of the reference? Um, and that maybe that would be a, allow, allow Scotty to perform equally or better than Square D mod. That's just one idea that I thought of actually this week, so. <laughs> okay, all right, that sounds promising. Are you sure the, the, the physical apparatus is beginning and output? And it's the different signal between those two that is used to get the polarization. Is there any way of feeding back this type of analysis into the physical object and improving the performance different signal? Um. Maybe. I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, since the uh, maybe, I think that the I think that the main restriction there is that the 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 beam is a function of not only the detector but also uh, the rest of the optical train, um, and so you would have to be able. To, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not an instrumentalist, sadly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm like, sorry. I don't have a good answer for that. Maybe. Laura, do you have an answer for that? Yeah, we can discuss that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is your phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a sense of how repeatable the beam patterns in are from groups of detectors? Like, are they all very similar, or is there a lot of variation? Right. So. Uh, the benefits of having this being around for so long is every year we get these, you know, we can do these calibration measurements. And so, and the other uh, point that I didn't mention in the experimental setup is that uh, it's possible to move the mirror uh, and do different orientations of the detectors relative to the source. And so when we do that, uh, we can get, it's a good consistency check and we can see that indeed the beams are generally pretty repeatable. Um, and also, I guess another benefit is that um, Scotty is a deterministic demodulator, while Square Demod has some coin flips built into it uh, for certain modes of it. Uh, and so, in the case, in that case, uh, Square Demod, there's a possibility that if you ran it on one data set and then you ran it again, you could get two different results. They'd be minor, but uh, that's another benefit of my implementation. Um, but that would that plays into that question. I think we might have time for one last question, if there is one. All right, if not, let's thank Will for a great talk. <laughs> and let's, thank our, let's thank all our excellent RU students who... <laughs>